everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Lone Coat Mafia Podcast. The internet's most hated mafia-themed geek podcast it is I, the Reverend Godfather, the show's main host and frontman. This week, bring to you part three of somewhat of an ongoing series that we've been kind of doing as of late. The reason why I say that is because we, I, sh- I couldn't say we, but the show over the past couple several weeks has been kind of helping Don with his uh, documenting Frederick's underground art slash music scene. And this week, he had us sit in and help record with the band, the Helgramites. Now, uh, we learned a lot uh, of setting up from last week, so there was no glitches that that way this week, but there was a few glitches because what um, I want to tell you guys and gals out there that might be listening to this is that um, we were thinking that because there was supposed to be a fourth person joining us, but uh, he, for some reason, uh, nothing against you know those that were there, just that he kind of because he that this person had a, a busy schedule, he couldn't make it to the physical interview, but he was willing for us to record the phone call. So I figured up, since there was an internet connection available, to kind of do what we do with Big Candy a lot of times, and have him Skype in or um, call him through Skype, and that way we were able to record things. But it turns out the internet connection that we were able to get to decided to be very spotty and therefore even though we recorded very well and things did um, come out very well indeed despite the fact that there was an air conditioning running on low uh, but what happened is that we did record the call through having to, the call on speaker so uh, there's that little bit of funkiness you're going to hear us uh, kind of talk about the internet being spotty and uh, trying to do the phone call. Um, I'm leaving that in. But um, also what happened maybe about 20 to 30 minutes later, give or take, um, there, Skype decided to quit um, and crash. And what happened was because it decided to quit, Audacity decided to pause. And I can't tell how long uh, it paused for. I want to say it paused for no longer than about 30 seconds. So, uh, I thought it was way longer. I was like, dear God, I hope to God I was recording uh, a lot of everything else prior to this, so I had a little bit of anxiety in regards to that. But it turns out, I think it was just maybe about, at most, 30 seconds. Uh, But... (laughs) I did, I went through everything, and I listened to that section of where it might have happened. I didn't notice anything, so if there's anything that all of you out know, notice that there's a kind of like a, a, a skip or a sizable skip, please uh, uh, let us know in um, the pin post on Facebook or email us at longcoatmafia at gmail.com and just let us know the time so <laughs> we know for our records, but... Um, and, but and when I again when I went through it, I didn't notice that little skip and jump. So um, it kind of actually worked out, probably worked out for the better. But um, later on, when it came to our turn to field a few questions, because this is mostly Don's project, and he's just graciously allowing us to record his content. Consider this a disclaimer. He's considering allowing us to do this this is his content this is his interview um and uh well when it came to our times he decided okay i'm going to kind of start packing up get a head start uh the for maybe about five seconds he accidentally unplugged um our our uh, mixer and plugged it back in so <laughs> there was just practically no hiccup. You won't, you'll barely tell it was edited out. It was five seconds, but um, no harm, no foul, no bounce, no play. But uh, it's great. It's a wonderful inter- interview. Uh, Don did have one of the other folks that's helping him on the project. Uh, her name is Heidi. So um, 
you'll hear her fielding some questions. She had because even though this is mostly Don's project and she is helping him with this, he had uh, both of them have or say had more priority over asking questions than we do. So, uh, and I have no problem with that in any way, shape, or form. So that also being said, there was one little instance that I couldn't get the microphone turned to her uh, fast enough. So therefore, uh, a little bit of it was boosted, not by much, but just wanted to let you guys and gals know. So uh, again, I hope all of you enjoy this interview and I'll see all of you in a way on the other side of this wonderful interview with the Helgramites. So take it away, Don. Good. Save it for the, the camera. Yeah, don't ruin it. Because you're going to say it, and then we, we won't know. And then I won't uh, be as eloquent? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, would almost be, Chris, it, would, it would almost be better, seriously, if you just turn the camera on and just left us alone. And, we and would, just talk. We would come back, we would back create a right, show come, for come you. Come back and Don't listen like to yeah, you would, you, yeah. would what, create, you would You would be... He'd probably sure. wind up what, what are you looking for in this film? X. Okay, then you should get some good stuff. Triple X. This is all internet, um, and, and I think Adam's... You guys have all been at the shows, right? So you hey, know man. what we're going hey, after. Uh, this stuff goes so into the interview's going to start. And People what they're going to do is, is your music, they're going to interview us, and then in about an hour, interviews. they're going to do a Skype yeah. call and, to you. And the podcast so will post it won't it be Monday. me calling you, it'll so be another I think the number. the nice part is to be, get, be but able to get the creative context to this show. Yeah, so they'll, they'll, they'll we'll try and well, I don't know if they can do FaceTime. It's going to be a Skype call. If you don't have video, that's fine. He doesn't need Skype, but I can call him. Call him. Okay, he he's... Needs Skype. You don't need Skype. You don't need Skype. He's just going to call you. The podcast guy's going to call you, okay? About an hour. In, a, about, in an hour. about an hour, okay? All right, so pick up the phone. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll see you then, man. Bye. So they're riding in their car. I thought we'd have another chair and mic with just the phone sitting in. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so can you hear me okay, Chris? Now go ahead. Okay, testing, testing. Yeah, uh, you can just leave it right on the table. And it'll pick me up good? Yeah. Good, okay. And that way, if Heidi needs to, all she has to do is reach over and grab it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, we're here with the Helgamites. We're going to do a nice little interview. We're going to take our time and we're going to enjoy ourselves. So starting at this chair, Mike, I would like for you to give us your full name, your age, and your, where you live at currently, where you're working out. Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Mike Johnson. Uh, I, my age, <laughs> 64, 65, excuse Incredible. me. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Uh, live in Brunswick, Maryland, and I work over in Hanover, Maryland. I'm a mechanical designer. Do me, honey, do me a favor and turn that down below. Yeah. You're a mechanical designer? Yeah. And, Mike, let me ask. How long have you been playing with the Helgramites? Since the beginning of the band. Uh, what is it in? 15? 15, oh, no, 17 it's 22 years. years. 22, good Lord. We started in 97. 22 That's years. The Helgramites. And as a matter of fact, me and this guy right here played together. I first met him when he was a. What would you say? You were a. a like an intern. Intern. Like intern like at the company that I worked at. Like an 83, 84. And uh, his parents were gone for the weekend. Kind of talked him into <laughs> throwing a party. A risky business type yeah. thing. Yeah, kind of talked him into throwing a party. And uh, wound up it was more musicians than people who everybody and their mother showed up at the house. He was freaking out because he was people, afraid he was going to get something guys broken. Guys were showing up that I didn't... I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Guys, right. they, they showed up with guitars and amps and... Is this where the party is? And I'm like, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I kind of invited an extra couple extra people. <laughs> there was a lot of extra people, dude. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we did that, and then uh, we just, uh, he and I had been um, playing off and on, uh, doing recording some home, home recording stuff, uh, making up songs, and uh, we were practicing uh, one time. 
over at your place, and we went through a variety of drummers. Uh, we had Travis. Oh, he sat on a milk crate. No, was it a milk crate? It was a little chest that he kept the sticks in, and, yeah. it, and it was really close to the floor. So he sat down low, and all you could barely see was his head peeking over the toms. All the, the, all the like drums this. were like, all, all the, yeah. they were all like vertical or something. It was, yeah, yeah. So um, other than that, and though, then we had Scott, and he he let was me just move over. Let me get your full name, Adam. <laughs> full name, Adam Strausner. And where are you? Age. Let me have your age, Adam. Fifty-five. Fifty-five. And where are you living? And what do you? I, do? I live in Middletown, Maryland. Middletown, beautiful area. And yeah. what do you do professionally? Um. Well, I'm. It's hard to explain. I'm a. Um, Teleport technician. I do satellite communications wow. and uh, stuff. fly satellites and do launch satellites and stuff like that. Now, how long have you played with the Helbermites? How long have you been part of this? Since the beginning. I, I'm, I'm a founding member, too. Founding uh, like, member? Like Mike, we're founding members. And uh, I started playing music with Mike back in, in the mid 80s. And then we started just recording stuff and writing songs together and recording them on a little four track in my apartment in, in Frederick that I had at the time. And uh, yeah, I mean we... With a drum machine. With a drum machine, yeah, we had a drum <laughs> yeah. machine. Um, so yeah, it was me and him and, and when I bought a house in Frederick and actually had a place that I could have a band, that's when we started. And uh, we just started by playing uh, the regular crap that every other band starts playing, classic rock, you know, that kind of stuff. And we had Marvin Kennedy was in the band at the time. Wow. Uh, Marvin wanted to do, like, uh, Dominant Life for him. He was really into Guar. Guar. And he saw, like, the potential of Guar. And we didn't at the time because it was a lot of work and we didn't want to wear masks or you know, we just wanted to kind of play music. So he was in the band, and, and um, I remember we got a gig at that Alpenhof. It was a German restaurant. It was downtown Frederick. And we didn't have a name for the band, and we were trying to figure out what, what we should call the band. And I came up with, like, probably one of the most terrible band names in history at the time. And... Um, that's what we used, um, and we played like what a variety of like classic rock, and I think we played a couple of his originals. He he had some instrumentals. Yes. He played, um, and for those who are curious, the uh, band name I don't think you even know what it was. It's it's really terrible. Uh, we called ourselves Eating Tiffany, which is just it's horrible. So after after we played that gig, we we were all like, we can't be eating Tiffany. This is awful. Um, so we did one of those things where, you know, come up with three names. Everybody come up with three names. Me, Sam, and Mike, and Marvin. Oh, no. you're jumping. What, what do we do? Huh? What, where did I jump? I'm not going to say anything. Uh, we'll let Sam in the band practice right now. All right. Now. Well, anyhow, we, good, good, we good, put good. the names, you know, in a hat. He came up with the Helgermites because he's a fisherman. And Excellent. We, when, we, when we heard it, we all were like, why, why even do this hat thing? Because that's the coolest that's damn name. That's, that's it. That's the coolest damn name. So we picked it. They were impressed with the hell part. Well, yeah, yeah. For a long time, we, we made, it's really anti-punk, but I, I, I made business cards, right? So I printed them myself. And I did them like fortune cookies, where um, you know you'll get a, a business card and it'll say your name, your company name, and maybe a little slogan. Well, the fortune cookie part of the cards was there's 15 different slogans. So the idea was you were going to collect all our business cards, right, to get all the slogans. So I'd have slogans like you know the helper mites, you know relive bad childhood memories, stuff like that. Um, your, your lucky numbers are blah, 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 just nonsense stuff. And I, I, I thought it was funny at the time, but anyhow, we... 
My favorite was uh, the Helgramites because we've got hell in our name. Yes. That was the best one. I, I kept that one. And we've had people come up to us. We play somewhere and ask, well, what's a Gramite? Like we put hell in front of Gramite and Gramite was something. And we were like looking at him like, what, what are you talking about? What's a Gramite? I, I don't know what a Gramite is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just tell him it's an ugly bug that catches fish. You, you can catch, put it on the end of a hook. And yeah, that's so terrifying. So it, it, it made. Oh, it'll bite the heck out of you. It made the perfect band name. Because, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. It's creepy, it's neat. Mm -hmm. So going on to Mike, say yes. full name, last name, where you live, and how long you've been playing with the band. So I'm Mike Wilkins, I live in Frederick, Maryland. Um, this is my uh, my second time with the Helger Mites. Um, I was in a, uh, a local Frederick band for a while, and uh, that band broke up at about the same time that... Who was that? Uh, uh, that was the uh, Loudmouth Underdogs. And um, we used to play some gigs with the Helger Mites back in the day. And it was about the time that that band broke up that um, Adam had to go to Germany for a while for work. And it just kind of worked out that I was homeless and they were homeless, and uh, so I kind of filled in for Adam while, while he was gone. I want to say real quick, just Marvin Kennedy, love Marvin, and he was actually the first interview I did. Mm, I mean, I, it was a long time ago. I, I know you know you said yeah, yeah. So it's difficult to see him, you know, uh, but just a great interview, fantastic time. Uh, dominant life form played the shows back in 1989, 1990 yep. with the Voodoo Love Gods. So, Mike, I want to start with you. Um, Brian Sussick, the leader of the Voodoo Love Gods, he's 62, right? So, one of the things that have been real fascinating to me is where does this love of punk rock, alternative, unusual music begin for you? And why is it part of your life for all of this time? What is it about this creative thing that stays with you? And that's going to go to each one of you. All right. I am going to say something that has been contrary, or is a little bit counter to my fellow bandmates, okay? <sighs> say it. <laughs> say it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay, when I first started, when I first started playing music, you know, I did not like punk. Okay, I will tell you that. I, it was something that I grew to love. Okay, um, when I first played, I played uh, hard rock, heavy metal, all that kind of stuff, because it was easier for me to learn. Okay, uh, my first experience with a pop, a uh, punk band. Was, um, I used to work at the, a place in Bethesda called the Psychedelic uh, back in the 40s, 50s? <laughs> Smart ass. Uh, late 70s. Right after Late the war. 70s, early 80s. Okay? And I was working the door, and uh, this guy says, Okay, Mike, we're going to have a punk band come in. And they used to have like bluegrass and, um, and stuff. Okay, who is it? The Cramps. So they came and they played. Okay, I didn't understand it because there was no bass player. Okay, it was a first show that I, I, I'm trying to be the bouncer there, and I'm watching, and it's the first time these guys got up in the middle of their set. They started running around, and it looked like a tornado sort of happening. And the next thing you know, they picked up the chairs and started breaking them. That's the first time I've seen something like that. I was like, wow. I don't know about that, man. That, that was a little bit deep, you know, and the manager was like, you know, we're not having them back again. So, I, I, uh, let's go a little bit back, in, um, a little bit forward in time, and to when I'm playing with Adam, and we started playing, and we were playing over at his place, and I remember we were trying to get a new drummer, just prior to getting Sam, uh, our current drummer, and Adam would make a comment, you know, gosh, man, it's so hard playing this other stuff in this comp. So he's, why don't we just play punk? And I'm going, us play punk? You sure you want us to play, you know? Sam has, like, been playing punk for a long time. Adam knew about it. I didn't know anything about it, so I was, like, kind of, um, you know, kind of a little bit nervous about 
picking up something and, 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 and playing something that um, I didn't quite know. Okay, uh, so they're playing the. He's playing the uh, the guitar. Sam's playing the drums, and I'm just trying to find some place that fits in. Uh, actually, now I've been playing it, though I did not quite consider the stuff that we were playing with the Helgramites to be punk. To me, it's just music that the bunch of us get together and we play. Other people have been calling, "Oh, they're punk," and I'm like. We just play music together. I, 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 didn't, I didn't consider it that. Now, I can't get in the car without pl putting on the tunes. Okay, uh, I play uh, punk on um, satellite radio. Uh, and uh, nine times out of 10, that's where I get my inspiration. I hear a lick or something like that from another band, and uh, I say, well, I'm going to try something like that, but let's do it our way. Or I just come in with the riff, and they're just banging away, playing stuff. And um, now I absolutely love it. Uh, I, I feel, though, embarrassed a lot of times when we go out and play in clubs. And there are other punk bands playing, and you know, the guys get together and they start talking shop, and it oh, this band and that. I don't know who the hell they're talking about. Right, right, right. Yeah. But you know, and then it, but, but then again, they come up. Oh man, yeah, you guys sound great, and I'm like. You get the cramps playing the thing though. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I did. I remember I because I, I remember I talked to a couple of those, and, and 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 it was weird that you know working at that club because there was like a lot of bands that would go through there that are relatively big names and then there was the oh what was it DC band uh, the butthole surfers yeah okay uh, and uh, who else who else who else <sighs> she was flag, maybe? black flag yes and I remember that I actually at one time went for an addition for the Butthole Surfers, okay? And this was back when I think they only, I think it was even before they had a CD. And uh, I was like, you know, I remember going there and telling my friends, you know, I went, but I played and I played my best, but I really thought I didn't sound that good and stuff like that. And uh, of course they never called me back, but. Um, at least you got. I, 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 I said I knew them that back then. You know, you says, great story. There, but for the grace of God, I could have gone I and I could have done something. But uh, anyway, um, that's my story. Adam, same question. Okay, well, I kind of remember it a little bit differently. Like I said, we had we we were playing with different drummers, and we finally got Sam, and uh, Marvin was still there. Um, moment. What year is this? Uh, 97 and um, that's when I went when we came up with the hell reminds us band but anyhow we were just playing like your typical classic rock stuff um, we all bring in cassette tapes of like Johnny winners or something like that to learn songs and Marvin Marvin's the one who actually in a way brought the seed that grew, okay? Even though he left shortly thereafter because he wanted more of like a metal band. Um, he brought a tape with the Ramones on it playing Beat on the Brat. Yes. And <laughs> I come from blue, a bluegrass background. I, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a banjo player. And my parents bought me a banjo when I was 13. And I got really good at it. I, I played with... Um, People like um, um, Bela Fleck and, and Tony Trishka I would meet Bela at the Gettysburg uh, Bluegrass Festival and play out in the parking lot with them and stuff like that. And uh, I could play almost as good as Trishka, almost as good back then. And this guitar thing was just new to me. I, I put a pickup in the banjo and I saw Fleck put, you know, uh, guitar pedals through his banjo, get different sounds. I wanted to kind of be like that. So I had a, a, a banjo and an amp, and, and my friend uh, Brent Progacine at the time 
I used to hang out with me, play bluegrass with me, is like, hey, all you need to do now is buy an electric guitar. I mean, you got a pedal, you got a flanger, you got an amp. So we went to Kohl's and I bought an electric guitar. So I'm just learning the regular stuff. Clapton, Creedence, that kind of crap. And we get together and we're, we're playing that stuff because that's what I know. Marvin brings his tape of the Ramones. And at the time in Frederick, this is what's being played. It's just Clapton and uh, Mustang Sally. And that, that, I mean, that's fine if you like it, but it's boring and, and everybody plays it. Sorry to those who like Mustang Sally. But anyhow, um, I hear this beat on the brat, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, I never heard punk before. And I was like, God, I, I was almost like, full stop, guys. This is what we're doing. This is what we're playing, because nobody plays this. You go to any place in Frederick, nobody plays this. This is awesome. It's high energy. It's like, you know... And we started writing our own stuff. We, 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 I think we learned Beat on the Brat, some, something to start getting the gestation going. And so we, we started writing our own stuff. And I, I listened to the Dickies when I was in college. I got introduced to them through a, a movie called Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Yes. So I started, I started listening to the Dickies. And I was like, these guys are cool, right? They write stupid little songs that are really fast. If you don't like them, they're over in two minutes, if right. not less. They're not these drawn out like ballads that just kill you. And uh, so I would write songs in that vein, just stupid little songs like throwing it and stuff like that. But I convinced the guys, let's, let's do this punk thing because the songs are easy. I can't play guitar. And I can't sing. None of us could sing. This is perfect. You know, going down this route is perfect. And and we did. And we we got shows in Baltimore and DC. DC? We yeah. played in Lancaster at the Chameleon Club. That's a long oh, story. Oh, that's a good story. I want to ask about that. That's a good story. But uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I just like Mustang Sally. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I started playing music. <laughs> Maybe I joined the wrong band. Um, see, how did I get into punk? It was a long road. Um, grow, I grew up in a very rural area. Um, the kind I grew up in, we had one high school at the time. I think now they have six or seven. Um, so, in that culture, everyone just listened to country music. So, my parents listened to country music. Um, I don't think I've recovered from that time of my life. But, um, you know, it's so like Garth Brooks was big when I was like in middle school and, you know, and then the Kentucky Headhunters came out and that, I think it was the first group that I had heard and was really into that kind of cross genres a little bit, you know, they were a little rockabilly. Um, and then I think what put me over the edge was, uh, um, the one thing I think we actually now have in common coming here, we didn't think we had anything in common. Um, was uh, skipping two uh, periods in high school in my buddy's uh, car, listening to the Ramones. Um, so we were skipping school to listen to the Ramones, and um, so I think that's when I kind of thought, "Wow, this you know this genre of music you know was something I could get into." Um, at the time, I didn't play any musical instruments, um, but like just a guitar. Like when I was a senior in high school, and never really learned to play it well. Um, and then um, I was uh, uh, working with some people over the summer. We lived in this house on this property, and uh, there were a couple musicians there. They were really into classic rock, Almond Brothers, stuff like that. Um, and they had this big party, and um, I had a couple beers, and um, they started the Doors song, and I just jumped on the mic and started singing, and apparently I could sing okay. So they made me their singer, and then they made me their bass player, so I learned how to play bass. Um, the first real band I was in was Loudmouth Underdogs um, here in Frederick, uh, which was kind of a kind of a pop punk um, sort of band. And um, at uh, one point, we we lost our drummer. We needed a new drummer. Um, what year is this? So we're now in around uh, around 1998, 97, 98. I was with LMU, 
And um, we found this really great drummer, but he wouldn't join us unless his friend and bass player could join us too. Um, so I decided, oh, you know, I'll just move to guitar. So I played our first gig with me playing guitar. I think I played guitar for a week uh, when we had our first show, which actually we played with the Helger Mites at the... Uh, uh, was it the Braddock? Was it the Center of the Arts? Center, Center of, the of the Arts. Oh, yeah, oh, that place. Yeah, oh, we did, that's a good story. Yeah, we, we did a show <laughs> called The History of Punk Rock, and um, it was a great show. So we kind of had, I think we had, what, four or five bands all playing different types of punk, everything right. from rockabilly to pop. Punk, it was so all ages. It was all ages, and um, so yeah, it was a fun time. Um, and so uh, that's kind of how I kind of morphed um, to end the punk. Um, at some point in between there, um, I discovered the Clash, and uh, that was there was no looking back. Um, once I got into the Clash, there was no looking back. I mean, what what kind of music I wanted to play. So. so how did you end up encountering these guys from Winchester to Frederick? Yeah. So um, so I, I moved down to Harrisonburg, Virginia, after high school. Uh, went to college down there. And I had a good friend of mine who um, was looking for a roommate because he was going to move to Frederick. Um, so we ended up being roommates, and that's how I ended up uh, in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, spent a little bit of time um, in grad school down at uh, College Park, and um, kind of never left Frederick. Um, I stuck around. So. Um, so ran into these guys, uh, you know, just from my old band LMU. You know, we would. Um, you know, play gigs together, and also um, Sam, who will be calling in here later. I've known Sam since I was 16 years old. Um, not even, you know, um, not even any music connection at that point in time. So, I've so always had a connection with the Helgramites because of because of Sam. I almost forgot that part of the story that I've known Sam. Yeah. That long. So I'm curious. Okay, so Loudmouth Underdogs. Who else was in that? So that was, um, you know, Rob Weddle. Um, he was the the uh, lead vocalist um, and primary songwriter. Um, and I guess the last iteration we had um, uh, Justin was on bass, Justin Shoup, and um, and we had a, a various drummers that came and went. But um, yeah, so so Rob Weddle, um, he actually. Um, moved to Florida for a time. He's out in California now, but um, he was actually in Oprah Winfrey's karaoke challenge ten years ago. Came in third place, so so uh, he was definitely a better singer than I ever. Strong voice. So show, tell me about the lineup now. You've added Mike back in again. So you're gonna sing solely and which instruments? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we all sing our own song we we kind of have this rule with if you write it you're you're singing it okay. unless we kind of think somebody else would be better at it um mike johnson plays bass um it, it awesome bass but then sam awesome drummer sam kathy yes um uh mike is awful guitar player is backing me up with guitar <laughs> and he sings the best He's the hey, best I, singer. I can't, I can't play guitar at all, and I can kind of yell and scream, and that's good enough for what we do. And uh, there, there won't be any more Helder Mites. This is it. He, he's allowed in because he's good enough. <laughs> and and the, the main thing is, it's not, it's not. I, I go back to, I think it was um, Bo Diddley that said it. I think it's Bo Diddley, where he would rather have. Um, 100% person, 50% guitar player, rather than a 100% guitar player, 50% person, because you can't teach him how to be a person. And that's that's the key. I mean, the reason we've been together that long, we yeah, get right. along together real well. It really doesn't even have anything to do with music at that point. It's, it's we, we understand each other, we, we joke with each other. It's a brother. 
what it is. It's brotherhood. I love what you're saying there. And and for me as an artist, I've always been like two dimensional. So the collaborative process isn't something that I'm extremely familiar with. So it's fascinating to talk to the musicians in these bands because you guys have to collaborate together to come up with your song. So let's talk about that process. We'll start with Mr. Johnson and all three of you guys finish. <laughs> all right. Okay, collaborative part yeah, of this how, band. How does this work? Okay, how does it work for me is usually I have all of my songs that I write, I like to tell a story. Okay, uh, usually it's a story that happened to me in my life or that someone that I know. Okay, uh, the only, there's only been a few exceptions. Okay, one song. Me and this guy were uh, texting each other at work. And we were, I don't know, what is it, trying to write the, the, the most disgusting song or the... I think we were talking about the actual situation yes. that occurred. And okay. then that just turned into poetry somehow. Yes, because he would write, I would write one line of the song, text it to him, and then he would try to outdo me <laughs> Uh, 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 with the song oh, okay let, let me back up okay one of the things about our band is that um, our music and our songs we don't take ourselves seriously we don't take the world seriously and a lot of times we poke fun at everybody which has gotten us into more trouble because people who don't know us they see us and they think that we're for real because of the subject matter of the songs. And uh, what is it you said, the, the comment about uh, being uh, misogynistic? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. With he, the songs. And, women, and, and it's not that, it's not that, okay, he's talking about all my songs, okay. <laughs> uh, it's not that, not that I hate women, it's that. That's, it's, why we, that's why we have the rule that if you write it, you have to sing it. <laughs> So, so he says, oh, yeah, it, it, it's all on him. Okay, no, it's, it's just that I've written a couple of songs about being treated very badly. Okay, uh, being a nice guy, nice guys never win. So if you're being a really nice guy and you get up enough nerve to take, ask a girl out and you go to the bar and you go to the bathroom and come back and there she is uh, holding court with three other guys. And says, you know, do you mind if I leave with him? Ah. Okay. Okay. Hey, we've all been there. We've been there. Yeah, you know, so sometimes I lose my temper no, and right. throw my beer in her face. I, I don't, <laughs> you know. Uh, but with, with the with the creative, back to the creative part process in the band. Um, a lot of times, I'll either have a whole song worked out, and I know where all the parts are, or I'll just have the words, and maybe the bass line, and I'll just come in and. These guys will put in their parts or whatever they feel right. And it goes back and forth, and then we get into this collaboration where, you know, well, maybe play the guitar like this, maybe play the bass like this, you know, stop, start, uh, you know, and then we'll do the song, and it may be possible that we'll play the song for like a month, and then somebody goes, hey, let's change the beginning. And it doesn't matter who, it seems like it doesn't matter who writes the song, everybody's open for constructive criticism. I really enjoy that with the band. Uh, I've played in bands before where somebody comes in with a song and you can't critique that person's song. You can't say, well, maybe this part might sound better or whatever it is because certain musicians that I've had the pleasure to work with have been very thin-skinned. Uh, and usually I don't like playing with people that are that are uh, like that, or you gotta uh, walk around um, on eggs, eggshells, yeah. eggshells yeah. with, with with certain people. Um, you should be able to take uh, and 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 uh, constructive criticism, and quite frankly, sometimes we get really cutthroat with our criticism, but we all take it in jest. You know, I mean, it's it's everybody's trying to produce a good product. That's it for me. So, so to, to kind of add to what he just said about being cutthroat, 
there was a time in our practice space at, at my house in Frederick where I would set up a piano like this and we had to actually film us playing. We, we, we record our practices and I was filming it. And the reason I was filming it, what do we look like when we're playing? Okay, and that's part of knowing what, what you, you know, right? And there was this one song, I can't even remember what it was, but, but I got it on film where we're working out like what to do in the song. We're trying to change the parts or something. And he looks at me, I, I'm, I'm playing something. And he's, like, <laughs> he's like, wait, 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 wait. And he looks at me, I'm looking at him, he goes, I got an idea. Don't play. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks at me, it's like, don't play. Oh, and it's gosh. just like a funny moment. Like I'm just looking at him, and it's just like this dead like pan, like shock moment. Okay. <laughs> but it, it, I think it's because. But it actually worked good, out in the song. We got a good sense of humor about life, so the criticism doesn't come off as harsh. I mean, I, we've never gotten an argument. I mean, we've been together 22 years, and none of us have, like, gotten into arguments where we couldn't work something out. Like, every everybody's idea, I, I mean, apparently turns out to be a good one. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to explain, but it's, it's you know, so we, we kind of just let it let it roll like that. I think one of the advantages, though, is that, that, that because each one of us comes from sort of a different musical background yeah we that, have that, that we bring we bring a lot to the table so things I draw on from my musical experience and I say well I remember a song we used to do that da, 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 to bring that and try to blend that into the whole of what uh, of what Adam's doing and you know stuff and um, uh, then the stuff I don't know where you come from with your stuff, but his stuff is absolutely it, it fits. It fits. It actually fits. He he plugs a lot of holes in in, in, in the music. Um, and then there's stuff that our drummer and and quite frankly, I've never heard anybody that plays drums like him. No, you Sam is like you one know, of a kind. But it, but it works. And it, it works. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where I don't think we would continue. Like if if we lost somebody. I think it would be done. Like we wouldn't try to replace any. There can't be another helper mic. Right. There's four of us, and that's all there will ever be. You know. But uh, like when when I come up with stuff, it usually I'm thinking of um, I'll write something. I don't really write anything. I just I'm I'm practicing guitar, and I'll come up with a riff or. or or progression or something a rhythm that I think hey this is pretty cool and what happens with my stuff is I'll do that and I'll be like oh this sounds like something Tom Petty would play this sounds something like what Mark Knopfler would do with Dire Straits this sounds so everything that I write is sort of in the vein of another artist that I know of that isn't necessarily punk some of it is. Some of it's like in the vein of what the Dickies would do. Like throwing it is is a good like Dicky like song. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll I'll usually create the riffs and stuff first, and either come up with lyrics or bounce it off these guys. The guy I usually bounce it off is Sam. Sam can write some really good killer lyrics. So, but he, he can't play guitar. He and I. He and I he play he play usually play. write songs oh, together where he'll come up with lyrics and he'll, he'll say, hey, look at this, and, and he'll put it on my little music stand and I'll read, read through it and I'm like, okay, and, and I'll, I'll try some stuff and then he'll, he'll say, uh, hey, yeah, can you do it? I, I kind of hear it like, you know, and he'll start doing, doing this, like he's just playing Drum drums. Speak. And then he'll, he'll 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 try to tell me like what chord progression by going yeah it, it kind of goes like and, and it's like that's that's what it'll be and I got to go with that and I'm like okay and and I'll try different stuff and he'll, he'll try to correct me and no no it's more like because he's tone deaf 
He can play drums great, but Sam is so toned up. Everything he sings, you wait, we'll it watch it. It's, it's just, you know, uh, like Surf is a good example. He wrote the song, Go Surf, and it's all just monotone. <laughs> Which is fine, okay? It's fine. I love him. But when he's trying to explain like a progression, it's like, you know. Well, it's, it, it, it's different, you know. When Adam when Adam writes a song, you know, he can tell me, you know, A, B, C, right. you know, you know, whatever, right. you know, Mike the same way, you know, right. or like I write something. Since Mike has experience playing bass, he looks at my left hand and he knows exactly what to play. Right. Okay, uh, with Sam, and they're doing this stuff, and then constantly I come over to practice if I'm late. Right, it's we've my own this, doom. Okay, we've, we've got the song. I, I, I show up, and, like five, and they're coming like, Mike. We want to show you a new song, and I'm like, oh my god, because it's 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 just out of completely out of left field. Because um, Sam came in with the words, and then Adam's trying to put music to it, but it works. And all the songs really works. primarily are, are created in like five to ten minutes. We, they're not; these aren't, you know. Create these aren't art. No, no. I mean, these aren't creations of art. I mean, I'm going to be honest. It's 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 five, it's five minutes of like just playing crap on guitar that I can't play. I really can't play guitar. I've been playing guitar for like I, I don't know long from the mid '80s, and I I haven't gotten better. I mean, I've always been just awful. And I'm and, worse than he is. And, and, and but with I, punk, it works. Yeah, well, that's what that's why we do it. That's <laughs> why it it's like I can't play guitar, sing. Punk is perfect for this. <laughs> yes. And and to be totally honest, since w with my bluegrass background, I, you know, looking back, bluegrass is the punk of country music. Absolutely. And 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 if you really look at what punk really is, punk is any. Uh, Brent Progesine. Is a good buddy of mine. We used to hang out all the time. He he used to say that rock and roll was made for any pimply faced kid with a guitar. And I think now that I look back, it's wrong. Punk is made for any pimply faced kid with a guitar because they don't have to be good. They don't have to be virtuosos. They don't have to be Clapton or Hendrix to be you know recognized and enjoy performing. They don't need they don't need to be top of the line, you know? And bands are the, the, the sum of the parts, right? It's not the individuals. I mean, it's, it's the sum of the parts that make the band. So you can have like a fan- I think said something like that one time. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm the same with the same uh, follow up on the collaborative process. Sure. Just hit Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sitting over being quiet. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I go about it different ways. Um, there's been a song or two that uh, Sam has written the lyrics for, and he gives to me because Sam and I probably have more in common in terms of our musical interests than the rest of the band. Uh, Sam and I are both you know, really big Clash fans. We're uh, we're both kind of in the reggae. Though Sam's really in the reggae. Um, and um, so he gave me a song one time and he goes, I want you to do some Joe Strummer thing to this. And I remember sitting on my back porch and at the time, um, I think Street Core was the album that came out, uh, Joe Strummer and Mescaleros. And uh, in that album, Joe Strummer pulls musical influence from all over the world. You know, it's almost world music. Um, and that album was stuck in my, in my mind the whole time I was reading his lyrics and um, you know out popped the song um, or at least the, the uh, melody part of the song for Sam. Um, there have been a couple songs I've written lyrics to and music. Um, I'm kind of all over the place um, and, and how I create um, stuff. It's kind of fun now uh, having just returned to the Helgermites um, because uh, in, the, in the few years I've been away, these guys have, have written a ton of songs I'm trying to catch up on. They've kind of gone some different directions than uh, where we were uh, when I left. It's, it's getting crazier. 
Um, <laughs> songs are getting crazier musically, which is, is great. Uh, but, but coming back in, um, it's just kind of fun because now, okay, we have a second guitar back. Um, we don't, I don't want to do the same thing that Adam is doing and vice versa. Um, so I kind of have this new creative process now of figuring out what to do on top of Adam's guitar uh, coming in as the literal fourth wheel. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. One of the things that I'm, I'm loving about this, and you brought the word up, is brotherhood. Like, what I'm witnessing is you all are extremely intelligent, highly communicative. Like, I think that's a huge piece of your longevity. But what I want to do is take me into your clubhouse. What does Bram practice look like? How long does it go on for? everywhere. <laughs> porno, and there's like three or four televisions running porno. <laughs> no, no, no. Which ties no, into our, never mind. Well, <laughs> well, you see, I used to have a lot of stage fright when this first started. I, I'd get really anxious and, and everything. So I kind of studied my problem, what the problem was. And part of the problem was when you go on stage, um, especially in Baltimore or DC, it, it, these clubs that really kind of take their entertainment seriously, you get a lot of bright lights in your face. And you're not practicing in that environment. You're practicing in an environment like this, where it's kind of laid back, you get natural sunlight, you know, nobody's staring at you. But when you get up on stage and those bright lights are in your face and you can't really see who's out in the crowd, but you know there's a lot of them out there, you get scared real fast. It's disorienting. So what I did to these guys, chagrin, because <laughs> they they hated it when, when I did it. Yeah. But in the in the basement of my uh, Frederick house, I put up track lighting, and I had like you know the little spotlights in the track lighting, and I put the brightest balls that I could put in there, and I put it, I aimed them all so it would be right in their faces, in my face. And that's how we practiced. We practiced lined up like we will be when we're playing. And I'd set up a camera, film what we looked like. We'd set up the recorder to film the session. So after the session or during our, our break in the middle, we could listen. Well, how do we evaluate. sound? Yeah. Do we sound okay? Do we not sound okay? That new part I'm putting in, does that sound like crap? Does it, does it bring the whole thing down? Look. And after practicing like that for a while, Getting up on stage was a piece of cake. I'm used to practicing with lights in my face and not being able to see. Immersion therapy. So now, now I do the opposite, okay? Because in Frederick, a lot of the places are, are, are kind of shitty to play in, okay? So I For installed... booking, go to www.hungermind. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got this practice space and uh, it's usually lit with fluorescent lighting. So I, I took all the, the regular fluorescent lights out and put black lights. So now you walk in this space and you turn on the light, it's nothing but black light. The little lights on the wall. Oh yeah, we got, yeah we got a string light, but I did it so now you're in like this dark cave-like area where you can't really see your instrument that well. Because sometimes you end up playing at a place like that and you, and you you play like back in Baltimore. Uh, what was what was that? The Mojo Room. Mojo Room. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we played up there, and they had a habit of they had a guy running lights, and when you finish the song, he kill the lights. That was part of the you know, and, and the crowd would go, ah, clapping and stuff like that. I'm tripping over the stage, or or they start the song, and he's just got like the one blue light on the drummer. I can't see where I am on the neck, so it was, it was like uh, you had to remember where to play and stuff like that, but his basement now is... It looks like a nightclub down there. It looks like a nightclub, even got the flashing... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we got a little sign that he got, a neon sign that says rock. rock. Yeah, and it flashes. <laughs> it flashes. Uh, what is it? I gotta get Sam to put Mr. T back on his drums. Yeah. He's got a little bobblehead Mr. T. Um, but um, it's, it's nice, it's cramped, it's like... It's like what you're going to experience it's on a small stage. For me yeah, now, you know? I, I don't get st stage fright at all anymore. I, it doesn't. I, it doesn't hit me at all. It's it's weird now. 
But I mean, when you practice in that environment, you just, it just, it, it helped me. I don't know if it did anything in these guys. It probably annoyed these guys. But that's, that's. You the, never annoy us, Adam. <laughs> 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 we are unannoyable, if there is such a word. With that. I want to, I want to ask about uh, the Blink and Staff connection, oh. as well as the imagery and the stage show. And I'll, I'll start with Mike. I don't know your connection with with Blink and Staff. I can go to whoever. But what are you guys trying to do with your imagery, your stage show? We hear you guys talk about it. You know. Let's talk about that that stage production and that actual stage value. Sure. I mean, honestly, you know, when we set up on stage and play, it's really no different than band practice to us. Um, you know, we don't call each other, decide what we're going to wear the night of the show. We show up wearing what we show up. I just think that kind of reflects on our, you know, not taking ourselves seriously. Um, you know, we're not in this to you know get a recording contract and. You know, you know, we're all we're all past that age. Um, yeah, we're not going to be famous. We're not going to be famous. Um, we decided that last night, preparing for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, still thinking on it. We came to grips. <laughs> it's not we decided. Yeah. We came to grips. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it's casual. We just show up. We strap on our instruments and we go. Um, I mean, that's about as flashy of a thing we have on stage um, as the banner. Yeah, Blick, Blick and Staff made that yeah. banner for me. Now, are you the connection to Blick and Staff? Yeah, or? pretty pretty much. How far did you and, and Blick and Staff go back? Back in, into the 90s, probably early 90s, yeah. I met him uh, through Dan Webb. So Dan's By the way, we used to play with Dan. To, well, well, Dan, yeah, Dan would come over and jam with us, but I was in a band with Dan uh, playing bluegrass stuff. Uh, called it the Missing Links. It was me on banjo and Dan Webb on guitar and Chris Bay playing upright bass, and we did that for a while. But um, yeah, I've known Steve for a while. I've gone on trips with him. We went to New York City to see David Bowie on the on the Daily Show, and that was pretty cool. We stayed with God. I can't remember the guy's name. I, I think he was with the psychedelic furs or something, a keyboardist. And we stayed with him for like three nights in a row and he kind of showed us around, you know, the music scene of uh, New York City and stuff. That was kind of a cool trip. I've, I've gone to like Chiller Theater with him and Marvin. You know, it's a horror sci-fi convention we have in New Jersey. So I've known him for a while. So when we had this band, I thought we'd be stupid not to use him as as our artist, right. you'd be just stupid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because he's world known for the Cramps cover and, and everything. And, and he's also that, that, when you look at the Frederick music scene, when you look at the true underground uh, music under scene, underground scene, Blickenstaff is all over it. You know, with his imagery, he's touched everything. And it's almost by like having him involved in it, you're anointed. Well, you're good enough for his attention. And, and, and the, the guy's real personal. Oh, he's I mean, really, it, it, it's easy to work with Steve, and, and so, you know, I, I would just go and say, hey, uh, we're making this album, can I get a piece of art? I'll give you like 300 bucks, and he would make it, and I would use it, and he, I mean, I, I think this was like 350, I gave him 350 for, I would just, I would just give him a number, he would never, he right. never asked. Like, well, I charge this much. I, I would just say, hey, Steve, you know, I want I want something that says the Helgermites, but I kind of like it in the vein of the monkeys. Do you think you could do something like in the vein of the monkeys? Because that, I always loved that logo. I always thought that was the coolest thing ever. And when he showed me this, I was like, I think I, I, think I gave him more than 350 for it. Because I was like, this is perfect. I'm like, I, I couldn't... If I could draw, I don't think I would have drawn this. And I think in every single interview we've done, the, the monkeys come up at least once. <laughs> what I love, though, okay, so this banner, I love, I was at a sign shop. I made that banner. Oh. And you came in the doors probably like 1980, 99, yeah. and I recognized the Steve Lickenstaff art, and I was like, oh, 
my god, I gotta make this thing. And so full circle, yeah, my hands were on that banner back in the day. So. Isn't that something? Uh -huh. Small world, small yeah. world. And then we had the same thing put on the drum, uh, bass drum. With the bass drum, and Fantastic. we've been fortunate enough to be blessed that Steve has done the cover for every single one of our CDs. Yeah, I'm trying to get a third one. That's where I wanted to go, and we're down to our last few minutes. So let's talk about your history. Name the albums you guys have released, and if we have time on this tape, favorite songs. Okay, well, the first one is just self-titled The Helbermines. And, uh, we, you know, it was like kind of a picture disc type of thing. It came with a, a temporary tattoo, not, not much else. I mean, this is basically it. And um, my favorite song on here, even though we don't play it much anymore, um, well, there's several that I like, but one of the ones that of note that I liked because um, it always was a shocker. It was called Jesus Loves Me. And all it is, all it is, is it's Jesus, it's, it's Jesus Loves Me. Yes, I know. It's just whatever. But I changed the music. I did the juxtaposed thing artists do. So I made the music as like ugly and hideous as possible. And we sing the song like an answer back where I'm saying, Jesus loves me. And he... He answers back, yes, I know. Like I've been, like, you know. Like he's annoying. Like, like, like he's annoying. I, like yeah, he's like annoying. I just keep telling people. Right. She you know. Jesus. And I always kind of like that just because it's, it, we played that in Baltimore. And, oh, yes. They took us seriously up there. Well, it was weird because a lot of these clubs, you're an unknown band, you play, and people aren't really paying attention to you. They're drinking their beer, talking to one another, and you're playing your stuff. And after you finish the song, you get a <laughs> from one or two people, but most people are blah, 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 talking. So we play Jesus Loves Me, and we finish the song. The place is packed. They're all staring at us. Nobody's talking to one another. Nobody's drinking. <laughs> Nobody's, you know, saying, what the fuck was that? They're all just like staring at us. Staring at us. Like, you could hear a pin drop, you know, and at that point, I was like, we got them. Oh, we got to get out we of here. Got, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I was thinking, we, we got them. They don't know what to do with us. They can't ignore us. They can't, they can't ignore us now. And at the end of the show, there were so many people that came up to us like, oh, I'm so glad that you guys played for us. And being a bunch of old guys, they think we're from the 80s, which we kind of are, but we aren't like the Ramones or anything, but right. they, they think we've been doing this all our lives and we grace them with our presence and all that. It, it, was, it was a pretty fun show. But here's the second album. This one is called Five Years for 30 Minutes because uh, it took us five years to put out 30 minutes worth of music. And this is Blick and Staff Art 2. Um, this is one that he actually drew freehand instead of uh, on a computer. And this one also, we kind of had a cool idea for a picture disc. Um, so he drew that. I wanted, like the letter H, I wanted something that you could put on a t-shirt like, like this, like an emblem. Uh, you could put that on a t-shirt and then he also had the, the Helgramites, like what's above me done in monkey style, you can put on the back of the t-shirt. Um, so he did this art, I, I can't remember how much I, I paid him for it, but it's, it's phenomenal, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, you know, why would you, why would you not use talent like that? In this one, um, In all honesty, I really, I really always like both sides and Alan this. He sings this song, and I always like that song. But what about you guys? What songs did you guys like on either one of these? Now, Mike was not on the first album. Um, he came after. This was released in like uh, 2001. 
I don't know. I mean, there, there are so many songs in this. Like Ron Klaus is a is a song that you guys did before I joined. Yeah, totally different feel than anything we do today. But well, I've that's always, I've always liked that song for some reason. That, that's the other uh, thing that's that has been said that's good about our band is we don't we we have a sound, but we don't have a sound that every song sounds the same. Like because of our various influences, if he writes a song. It, it'll sound maybe like a Clash song, or it'll take those kind of notes out of it. Um, if he writes something, it'll be something else. If Sam writes something, it'll be something else. Um, so when you hear us play a show, you won't be bombarded by like the same rhythm, rhythm patterns. You won't be bombarded by the same drum beats song after song. Sometimes you go hear a band, and it sounds like the same person wrote every song. Like it'll be the same kind of guitar riff, maybe changed a little bit, and it's you, you won't get that with us. It, you you will not. That doesn't happen. I, I'd have to say, "Thrown It's my favorite song on, on this one. Really? Because it's as simple as those little like octopuses that you throw on the wall and they climb down. That's what he wrote the song about. And that's the Dickies influence song. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's that's just about something stupid. <laughs> Oh gosh! And actually, the, the, the funny thing about that song is, um, hold that thought. All right, we're on intermission, gentlemen. <laughs> Bathroom time. <laughs> Man, it's like, like a mind shirt. Would yeah, we, we throw like a little like, like, work. Uh, kind of like a handlebar. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Honk, That's honk, fine. Honk. Yeah. Can you get them on speaker? No, it, it, it's going to stop me right now. Um, I need to pause this one. He's yeah, really yeah, yeah. He answered. He answered okay. Getting it good. Internet connection dropped. No, it's bad. We just speaker phone. Yeah, yeah, pretty much it comes to the speaker. Hello. No answer. I wonder, could we, if one of them called, could we speaker it? Yeah, I guess we ought to just put a mic, lay the phone right down. Well, when I called him before, he came in really good, so, I mean, I could yeah, try we're it. we're just going to do what? Like, so, like. This is the call, so just stay on the line. Hi, Sam. Hey, Sam. Hey. Sam. Can you hear us? Yeah, we'll see how, we'll see how well the hearing goes. And the connection goes. Okay, so Sam, this is Heidi. You've got Don and your entire band here, and Tim. And we just want to go over a couple quick things. Could you start and give us your full name, age, and what your history is with the band? My name is Sam Kathy. I am 52, and I have been with the band for I don't know how many years, 20 something years. And what do you think about your creative process with the band? What's your contribution in that capacity? Um, I have written a lot of the lyrics, I would say. But most of our, I think most of our writing is a group effort, I would say. People have, I might have some lyrics or someone might have a chord progression, but it's, I would say we all kind of equally bash the things out. And one of the things that I'm absolutely loving is, well, the communication, the intelligence factor, and the longevity of you guys. What do you think is the reason for the longevity? What, what's the longevity you're asking about? Yes. Yeah, I, well, we're all old guys, and so we're not um, out looking to be famous, and we obviously like the music. And like playing together, I I enjoy our songs even years later. They're to me they're a nice mix of kind of fun and some creativity, but they're also a bit of a physical workout. And I, so I like the whole combination of being able to be a little creative, but also get sweaty. What are some of your favorite songs that you guys have recorded off of the two uh, CDs that Adam brought today? 
favorite songs we've recorded. Yes. Um, I don't know that I do. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I um, I guess favorite some favorite ones are ones that I think we just played really well. Like um, actually, on the first record, I really like Friend Zone. It's a it's a great story. It's a fun song, and I think uh, played very well. And it has one little tiny drum lick that I can actually pull off once in a hundred times and happen to do it on that recording. So it's locked in place. Like I can actually play that well, but it's all just a sham. <laughs> So we got some background, um, so some Dickies influence, some Clash influence. Where do you pull from? Um, well, I came, my background is actually 19th century rudimental drumming. So uh, when I was a little kid, I listened to a lot of rock and roll and all, but didn't have any great desire to play it. But I did like... Um, before I got into the punk scene, I was definitely a kid listening to Steve Miller and listening to Jimi Hendrix and listening to Led Zeppelin and all that kind of stuff. But then uh, in uh, high school, I started to get turned on to the punk and the reggae and um, in college started playing in, in a band. But I'm the reggae guy of the group. And really, I listen to more. I listen to more reggae than anything else, but still listen to a lot of punk. So, what was your band in college? <laughs> they were called the Philistines Junior. They still exist, and our guitar player is a very successful uh, producer and recorder. Record runs his own studio in Southern Connecticut. Has worked with a lot of big bands, so I. So they're still functioning, so but I left them. I left them in 1990, I would say. You joined the Helper Bikes started in '97, correct? Yeah, I took. I, yeah, I didn't really play for about five years. It's uh, it's a big time commitment. It can be being in a band and I was switching jobs and doing graduate school and I was poor as hell and et cetera, et cetera. So I hemmed and hawed for a couple of years about whether I wanted to get involved in that kind of commitment and then just put an ad up in uh, making music and put, put bands I was into uh, like The Clash and I threw out some quirky ones like Jonathan Richman just to see if anyone would call and uh i think it was adam who called me and then we play we played a couple times and it was just kind of fun to play again and uh they were all I mean, they were all over the place when i first played with them so they would play punk they played blues they played rock new wave i mean you name it they were all over the place and that was fun a fun way for me to get back into playing after kind of dropping it for about five years. And are you in the Frederick area? Uh, at the time I was. I, I grew up in Massachusetts, but um, I was living yeah, in, in Frederick when, um, and I was I was teaching in, in a high school in Frederick when um, when I hooked up with these guys. And is that your day to day? You teach. I, I, yeah, I teach still, but uh, in West Virginia. Okay. Where at in West Virginia? In uh, Hedgesville. Oh. Near, Mar near Martinsburg. Yeah, that's yeah. where we're recording in Martinsburg. Yeah. Okay. Um, one follow-up question um, about the collaborative process. Talk to me about working with these three other guys and what that's like when you guys go to form a song and that'll be our last question what's your favorite uh, song that you guys have done oh my I gosh i already asked that friends yeah i have no i no idea now who's your favorite member of the band so there you go <laughs> you like the most. what i can't hear what are you saying 
Who's your favorite band member? <laughs> Who's my favorite band member? Me. <laughs> Me. <Good. laughs> Always choose yourself first. That's perfect. <laughs> I'm. The, I'm. I, I. Without a doubt, I am the best drummer in the band. <laughs> In fact, I, in fact, I recently found that Adam will never be a drummer. Yeah, I'm pretty bad. I'm pretty bad. Sam, we're good. I wish you were here, but we're going to go ahead and pick up with the other guys. Thank you for your time, okay? Okay, cool. Awesome, see you next man. week. Thanks, Sam. All right. All right, I'll see you. Uh, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Yep, see you tomorrow. <laughs> For this last part, we're just gonna do a little bit more relaxed. Oh, it, it, it hasn't been relaxed yet? Yeah, Wait, exactly. But this is, we, we just went through the tennis part? We might not talk too much about music. But Adam, let me get my camera going. Oh, wait, you were recording all that before? Yeah. No, we <laughs> thought we were just oh, bullshit. Oh, damn. <laughs> damn. Yeah. I need to yeah. be serious now. Um, no, this is the relaxed part. Oh, okay. This is the rel yeah, this is the relaxed part. Right. <laughs> Adam, the thing I'm most fascinated by, especially with our conversation, is I know we have met when we were younger, but unfortunately that's you know so let's talk about the community of musicians that you've mentioned. Let's talk about the spades, but let's spend a little bit of time. We'll start with Marvin Kennedy. And let's talk about working with him as an artist, as a musician. If you guys have played with him, if not, you know, we can talk about some other guys, but you know, let's talk about some of our friends from the past. Okay, uh, Marvin Kennedy, I met him through uh, Dan Webb. Um, and we started not really playing music together, but like uh, doing movie stuff together, like uh, going to uh, Chiller Theater in New Jersey. Um, he introduced me to, to people like um, Conrad Brooks back in the day, um, that kind of thing. And, and then we started talking about music and, and that kind of thing. He was more into metal. He liked Guar. He liked the uh, production that Guar put on, and he saw that as something that was missing for a lot of, you know, not just Frederick, but just anywhere to go to see a production like that. So he wanted to do something like similar, and uh, he created a band called Dominant Life Form. And I wasn't really involved with that, but uh, the little bit that he played with us when we started playing together, and we, we, we were not quite really the Heldermites yet, he added some of those influences. Those were some of the songs that Sam was talking about that were all over the place where we play a Clapton song and then we play something that sounded like heavy metal. And that, that would come from Marvin. So uh, I've known him for a long time and um, we didn't, never really wrote anything together except for uh, one song, Johnny's Lobotomy, we kept. That's on the first album. And Marvin actually wrote that song. Mike thinks it's disturbing. And Mike, in a good way. Mike, Mike, <laughs> in we, a good we, way. We, we, we would, we would he, he had the song written, and mm -hmm. I took like the first part of the song and just kept repeating it over and over again. And, and to this day, Marvin will say that I don't play the entire song. Even though I use all of his lyrics, I don't, I don't musically, you know, me melody wise, go to a different area that he. He originally wanted to go to and when we used to share the stage with uh, Loudmouth Underdogs where, where Mike was playing uh, we used to play that song and it was basically an open mic night thing at the raw bar and he he used to say that song always gave him the creeps because of just the 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 idea I guess of you know the lobotomy plus the way the music was Played, I guess, and the nail guns. The nail, the nail guns. guns. Yeah. Serial killer gets a uh, lobotomy. So, but anyhow, uh, the other the other guy that I played with a lot, I still we still do some things. Uh, is Dan Webb, and I play banjo, my bluegrass stuff with him. Um, earlier, we had two different bands. We had we had the Missing Links, and that was with Chris Spade. And he would write, Dan would write the songs, and I would write 
the music. It basically, writing bluegrass music to me back then was simply taking, uh, you know, the first part of song A that I used to play and gluing it to the part B of, you know, this other song and just gluing a bunch of bluegrass songs together and using his words. And his words were usually uh, like horror lyrics. Uh, I remember getting played on a radio uh, station, I think it was in Brunswick, and that little radio station. Oh, the AM there. station yeah. there? Okay. And they're playing a song. He wrote this song uh, called Moonlight. And the gist of the song was, you know, you meet boy meets girl, boy dates girl, boy drives girl, you know, out to lover's lane, murders her, and then buries her by a tree in the moonlight. So they play this song, and we're, we're like, none of these songs are going to get played. They're too, they're too horrific. And this is in the night, these late 90s, I think we did, early 2000s. And uh, they play this Moonlight song on the radio, and they're not listening. And the DJ's are like, oh, what a beautiful song, Married in the Moonlight. And, and we just burst out laughing. It's like, and, and he'd, he'd say, oh, should I call him and tell him? And I'm like, no. No, don't, don't let them figure it out. You know, if they keep playing the song, somebody will figure it out. <laughs> you know? let, them, let them figure it out. It was super catchy. I remember that. You remember that song? Yeah, yeah. I do. And then we, then we had another thing. It was just me and him uh, called uh, uh, El Gringo Bravo. Oh. And what he did, he convinced me. He would come up, Dan would come up with these ideas, and I would poo-poo them right away. I'm like, this is ridiculous, Dan. But I eventually kind of like it grow on me and I do it. So El Gringo Bravo, he's like, okay, I'm gonna wear this wrestling mask and you'll wear this one and we'll play like bluegrass songs. So I'm like, are you are you serious? This is real? You know, this can't be real. I, we're not doing this, Dan. Oh no no, this you know, and I'll talk like I'm Spanish or Mexican Mexican wrestler. So I get this this uh, mask on, this Mexican wrestling mask and it's it's just a black mask with a white like zigzag like that and uh, He said you'll be the human verb So I was the human verb and my stick was uh, he would do all the talking We play a song he do all the talking introduce the song and sing it And since I was the human verb I would just say I would just yell verbs out like stop or go or right. wait or, <laughs> <laughs> That was my stick so we played this, um, con it was a contest at the FSK Mall. And it was the first time they did it, I think the last time. And uh, he got in, and there's like 30 musicians playing this, 30, that's like America's Got Talent type thing. And I'm like, well, at least I'll have the mask on. Nobody will know who I am. So I go, what, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm, I'm going to change my shirt, put the mask on, and then come into the mall. We're going to play our stuff, and then I'm going to leave, take the mask off, put another shirt on so nobody knows who, who the hell I am. Because I was half embarrassed about this. So we, we go and we play our three songs and sell Bringo Bravo and the Human Verb. And um, we would have got first place, but the, the, the judges were like, we can't give you first place because people will think you're a clown act. And if we do this next time, we'll get nothing but clown acts. But you guys were like the best, like most engaging act up there. So we got to give you second. So we got second place on that, which I was amazed. I'm like, are you kidding me? Right. But uh, I, he would come up with some really wild ideas. And, and you know, um, it would take me a while to to get into them, but once I got into them, like the missing links, I thought, this is a really good idea. Nobody's doing this. We have a pretty cool sound. The songs are different. They're not typical bluegrass songs, and uh, I wish we could have kept it going, actually. That, that was fun. It was fun playing with Chris. I mean, it, it had the same feel. We all three got along together real well. Johnson, have you played with other Frederick musicians? Uh, Which ones come to your mind? Okay, like, well, with Marvin, 
but uh, with Marvin. You played with Marvin? Oh, yeah, in his basement. We played, played together. Uh, but the thing about Marvin that is more memorable for me, other than him being a musician, was his passion for film. Okay, and uh, sure. yes, one of the things because he got me into all of Conrad stuff. Okay, and one of the things that that surprised me was uh, when he came by and isn't he the one who who got got our song on one of the uh, Conrad's uh, movies? Yeah, on a couple of them. Yeah, yeah on he, a couple of them. Some and I just them. like you know, oh yeah, you're in the movie, and I'm like, what? And then they play the song, and I'm like, oh my god, I would have never picked that song to go with that scene but it fit okay so you have like that and then my experience with dan as i used to go and chat with him all the time uh at brainstorm but also knew him through adam and before i was never in a formal band with dan but i remember all the time going up to dan when dan lived in yellow springs yep he had the house in yellow springs used to go up there and jam with him and Adam all the time, okay? Yeah, he had a practice space. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I, I did that. Uh, my only experience with Frederick music scene way back, and I'm talking about like- That's what we want, wait. 70s or whatever it was. I remember playing, I did a couple of gigs at the, uh, the Blue Dragon. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I remember the little so oriental the woman so that used to be a man was Eddie the manager. Town. Yeah. Yeah, she she would have a Chinese restaurant. A Chinese restaurant during the day and at nighttime. Yes. Oh, yeah. I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what's funny about that whole instance is I, I watched a documentary lately and I can't remember what it was, but apparently this Chinese restaurant by day, punk club by night, mm -hmm. was not... Just that play that was nationwide was happening. Did you did you know that? No. Nah. Yes. No, there was one that was a nationwide yeah. thing that was happening for some reason in the seventies and eighties, where you'd have these Chinese restaurants push all the tables to the side after a certain hour, like eight o'clock, kick everybody out and then have punk clubs. And and when I heard that, and, and this is like in, in Washington State. They're, you know, all over the place. And I'm like, wow, that is cool that that was a thing. Like, we didn't have the internet back then to know it was a thing. But apparently, that was a pretty common thing where these Chinese restaurants were doing punk. It was just a really odd, so, you know. All of this, like, all, all of us are involved in that do-it-yourself community. What are some of the oddest places that you guys can think about where you've actually played a show? Jonies. Oh, oh yeah, we Jones. played at Jonies. <laughs> yes. Oh, they, these guys did. You, you want to tell them? You tell them. You tell the story. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't there. I was in Germany. Names and dates may be changed. Um, yeah, to protect. I got it. <laughs> um, no, there's a. Um, um, we, we played at Jonies once, maybe twice. Yeah. Um, the granary? Yeah, the granary. Yeah. You guys know Joni? Joni, the dressmaker. Yes. yes. Yeah, 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 she's okay. a, uh, she's a, a fixture there in too. Frederick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the, uh, when I first met her, she, model. she introduced herself as, Hi, I'm Joni. I'm a nude model. That's how exactly. she used to introduce yes. herself. <laughs> so go on. Go on. Well, you told the best part, with, but um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the story no, that I but, wasn't there. No, but um, you know, her, her parties are, are always very, um, very interesting and entertaining. Um, but the fact that it's in this old granary, and you know, you go up these narrow steps, and it's like to someone's big warehouse space. It was kind of, uh, kind of an interesting space. Um, you know, cookies comes to mind. No, 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 you're not finished with the story, no. Mike. Uh, he's just trying to skip it. He's trying. What, what part of the story am I missing? Yeah, let's hear the good part. Remember? Let's hear the juice. Okay. We, we get there yeah. and we're setting up I'm the equipment. Sure. We're setting yeah, up the equipment. And remember, I saw the picture yes. on the windowsill. Yes. You remember the picture, Mike? Explain what the picture was. Oh, I don't remember that detail. Oh, you I remember who it was in it. Oh, no, you don't. No, I don't. All right. There's this picture oh, on a little oh, Polaroid yes. on the, on, on the <laughs> windowsill. Okay. And 
It's a picture of somebody with a cowboy hat, a leopard skin cowboy hat, and chaps. Okay, and if you know chaps, you know how like you wear them with jeans, right. and, and and your jeans are in the back. Right. No jeans. <laughs> No jeans. And then I'm looking at this and I'm like, Sam, Mike, look at this. And it's just like, yeah, and he's, what is that? Is that a guy or a girl? I can't tell. I'm just scratching our heads. We couldn't tell. Okay, to put the picture down. I ain't going to say nothing. You know, new place. I don't know anybody. I'm not going to start nothing. <laughs> so then we're playing. And, and, and Mike is like, you know, oh, well, this is, you know, and, and, and it is his first. I think that might have been my first, first gig, gig with, with the Helgramites. First gig with the Helgramites, so, oh, you know, yes. you know, and, and we're like, okay, well, we play our first set, and we're done, and then here comes the halftime entertainment. Do you remember what happened? I am drawing a plate blank. You were it, 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 that scarred. <laughs> yeah, refresh my memory, Mike. The same person. In the chat. In the chaps comes waltzing through. Okay, uh, it's a guy. I don't know who it was. Like, it doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. But no, nobody. But wants to know. he doesn't have anything on under the chaps. Mark okay. Terry would be my guess. Keep going. He, I guess he's a performance artist. He was to and say and other things. Contortionist. Well. Troy was up there. Oh, Troy Cool, yes. Yes, Troy was the MC. And, uh, well, let's just say he challenged that individual and then asked if any ladies were game to make it rain. They made it rain. He contorted himself. Okay. And this did is something. It on the podcast. It is. <laughs> oh, There's gosh. There's a reason why I have E. Automatically tagged. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did, you know, and I, I could have sworn you sat up there and said, does this happen every time you guys play out? And you said yes. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> but, I, but I remember with, with Joni's, uh, okay, like that was weird. And then the uh, second time we played there, she had a, like a water tub or something like that. And there were these, the people used to, what is it, the... Um, it was like a breezeway connecting the two buildings. Yeah, yeah there is like a tunnel. It crosses, yeah, yeah in, in the tunnel. Uh, Street. So people weren't allowed to smoke in her building, but they could stand out there in the breezeway. And there was, so they walked across, but anyway, there was this hot tub. And there were young ladies relaxing in the hot tubs, all natural. So, I don't I mean, I go to that stuff, you know, and I'm like thinking, you know, okay, well, these are the. Oh, I'm so happy I'm here. The artists of Frederick, you know, I don't know them. I talked to Sam. Sam's like, you know, well, yeah, you know, it's it's Troy and Joni and you know, all kinds of weird stuff happens. You just got to go with the flow. Don't 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 be shocked or anything. You know, it's just people in Frederick, you know. So yeah, like let's go full circle with it. Like some of us, like you played probably out at the big house. Like Dom was a huge piece of like this whole. There was a BDSM photography culture going well, see, on. Oh, I, okay. Interspersed. See, I didn't even know any of that see, stuff. I, I, Did you? You were there though, weren't you? Did you? No, play I. I go. I would go to the big house, okay. and I would play with uh, Jill Grable and the Spade Brothers. They had yes. a band. Was playing that. The political yeah. blockheads. And, and I would play. I would play bluegrass back then. That's what I did, and. Um, because I did, I lived in Frederick at the time in an apartment. We didn't really have the Heldermites yet. That was kind of pre that. Okay. So I would, I was playing bluegrass with Jill and the Spade Brothers, and uh, I can't remember who played bass, but uh, I, I can't remember the name of the the uh, band that they had. But they were really good, and I wanted them to record stuff so bad, like. I was trying to convince him, like, look, I'll even pay for some sessions because I knew Zach maybe, and uh, through Dan, Dan Webb. I was like, we could get there for a couple hundred bucks, kind of save some of this stuff. I mean, Jill could sing really good, and, 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 and yes. some of the some of the the arrangements we had for some of the songs that we did were just really good. And I'm like, God, what are we doing? Like. 
that was one of the things that kind of upset me about the scene at the time was um, I think there was just too much drugs and drinking for me. I I took I took music as more uh, of an emotional outlet and uh, my way of like being part of society because I was kind of a loner and this was the only way that I kind of like made connection with anybody and so when I go to the big house and and you know see the drugs and the drinking and like people having sex on the steps and stuff it's like this is what I'm all about this isn't I mean I, I really like playing music with these people but this is out of control I can't I can't be seen like I, I don't want to be involved with this. You know, right. it's, yeah. it's... Yeah. Did you... in White Trash Girl, do you remember Jill's song? Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. played banjo you with played, that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I, and genius. that was one of them. I wanted to record some of the stuff because it was so good. And I just couldn't get them to, like, you know, either the, the space didn't want to do it or they couldn't get people together to do it. Um, it was just... It, it just was kind of heartbreaking. It, right. it was sort of like, man, I really want to, we could really have something. Because we were all young back then. And it was like, we could really have something. You guys have nothing. You're poor. You, you've got the talent. You could really, you could become somebody. Let's do this. And I couldn't, I couldn't get them off their asses. I, that's how I felt. I don't know how those guys felt. Remember but you, you, you told me a couple of stories. I was just about frustrated. What what he experienced at the house? Sure. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm not going to get into the details. Some nights where I'd wake up, I didn't know who the hell I was with. You, you know, I mean, next. But I mean, things like that happened because that was the. Oh, it was the '80s, and it was you know, it, 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 was, it was it was the times. You know, you 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 partied hard, and you know. It was think, culture. I think, and we'll go back, as we mentioned this earlier about drugs, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You get this idea, this notion in your head that that's part of it. When you're young, it's hard to recognize that your peers are having serious problems because you're right there with them. But then as you begin to move forward in life and you're letting these things become distant, other people don't. So picking up, let's talk about drugs. Um, any experiences you guys want to share and any any insights into drug usage, drug culture that you would like to, you know, share with younger people into the future. You know, well, what you might as well tell them your story. Good, bad, and indifferent. Again, which <laughs> one? <laughs> I'm just screwing with you now. Okay, I'll cut him some slack. Okay, one of the things with me is I used to when I was in high school. That's funny. I partied like nobody business, like nobody's business, um, and I'll be the first to say that uh, I didn't care about high school. I didn't care about anything. It was just going out and having a good time. Okay, but I had some serious things that. Happened to my friends, okay? One I had drowned in Carter Rock, uh, doing lewds and drinking beer, and he got caught in the current, and that was the end of him. Yeah. Another friend of mine, uh, he uh, wrapped his car around a telephone pole, okay? Uh, and it was sort of like the writing on my wall on the wall for me that I could see that some of my friends they just didn't make it to like 21 you could tell that they were you know uh, Johnny Winter used to call them fast life riders okay yeah they'll burn out by the time of 21 or people who party hardy it's part of your part of your youth and and eventually you sort of mellow out or you find out that you just can't burn the candle at both ends all the time because you have nothing left by the time you're 35. Or you got guys that still do it, don't know how to stop, and you look at them when they're in their mid-30s and they look like they're almost 50. Okay? Uh, and and uh, to me, it's especially hard on the ladies. Okay? Uh, especially people that I knew that were very kind-hearted uh, will give you the shirt off the back and stuff. Uh, but uh, 
certain other people who, uh, let's say, uh, spend a lifestyle moving contraband uh, back and forth. Uh, they will take advantage of other people who are nice, uh, set them up uh, as mules, or um, stashing stuff at their house and not even, you know, hey man, uh, I need to crash here for a couple of nights, okay. He goes away, leaves the duffel bag there in the closet, uh, and then the next thing you know, the police come in, find the duffel bag. The people who are totally innocent, they get busted. The person is gone. Um, but those things, those things, you know, to me, I had a couple of incidences happen to me. The one thing that changed my life was I'm just sitting there at somebody's house and we're, we were listening to the White Owl. And uh, sitting there on, 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 on the, on the um, and next thing you know, knock, knock, knock on the door. The girl goes, opens the door, the police came in, everybody up against the wall and stuff like that, and uh, it was a raid. Um, fortunately for me, there was nothing in the house. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the few times when there wasn't anything in the house. Okay. But to me, I'm like thinking, you know, well, if there was, even though I wasn't doing anything, I, 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 I would be going away for a while. How would I explain that to my parents? How would I explain it to my friends? You know, blah, 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 you know, and, and, and you try to explain that to a judge, and the judge is going to sit up there and go, well, I guess you'll think better next time about choosing your friends. Because judges have no sympathy. Uh, but uh, that, to me, uh, was always part of the attraction and also part of the danger of playing this music, of being a musician. Um, you know, you do it for the girls, you do it for the lifestyle, you do it for the money, especially when you're young, you know, thinking that you're going to be some kind of rock star, but, you know, at a certain point you got to say, hey, wait, stop, this ain't happening. Or if I continue down this road, I'm going to wind up like him. And he's pushing up daisies. So uh, that's why I stopped. Uh, and now, playing with these guys here. Um, he knows it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do it for fun. Right. We do it for music. fun. We do music for music. fun. Okay, okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> music. We do music for fun. We do <laughs> drugs for fun. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? Don't you know? Get your priority straight. But um, we, we, we play music. We play music for fun. Originally, I think uh, my intention was when I first started playing in this band, we're a bunch of old timers. We play music and stuff like that. And we were just thinking about getting together every once in a while just to keep the wrist loose, fight arthritis, and you know. We weren't that old 22 years ago. <laughs> I'm not that old now. I consider that. <laughs> I considered that old that when I was in. I know, I got away from that one, didn't I? Uh, okay. Are you the youngest? I am. I'm the baby of the band at 44. <laughs> so I bring the average age of our band to what, like 50 couple, right? Well, then you can help Sam bring all those drums in. <laughs> yeah. Mike, have you lost friends to drugs and alcohol? You know, uh, I'm pretty lucky. I haven't, I haven't lost anyone. Um, but you know, I've I've had friends that um, got into drugs and you know had some really bad times. <coughs> uh, they're still around, but um, it's unfortunate in that I uh, lost two drummers because of drugs. Um, the last one was this, the icing, you know, the the, um, the straw that broke the camel's back, and you know, the band just kind of dissolved at that point. But um, but I've been lucky; I haven't lost anyone. So yeah, there's always this tie-in thread between. Process, addiction, taboo, like it's a fringe-worthy kind of walk. But I think there's a thin line between genius and insanity. Yes. So, you know, I don't know, like, you know, the worst thing I do is, you know, drink some beers at night. But, um, you know, on, on occasion where I have a few too many beers, I feel creative and I start writing out lyrics, the next morning it's always complete and utter garbage. So yeah. I, I don't feel that it helps me in my creative processes. <laughs> 
I think every artist goes through that to where they realize that this actually interferes with my clarity. Mm -hmm. You know, that this, <clears throat> for me personally as a young artist, and, and, and I had a horrible drunk driving accident. I had Chris and Cam Spade in the car and Michelle Lolly. Um, I got 64 st stitches in my head. Uh, Chris or Cam got a broken rib. Doug Smith lost part of his ear. And that was it for me. That that was, you know, that, that I kissed death. I think I vaguely remember that. I kissed death and I knew at that moment, like, okay, I'm going, I think that was 1993-ish, you know, when that, that, that happened. I remember that, yeah, because Cam ended up with the lungs, yeah, the rib, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. See, you brought up um, addiction, and um, you know how they they say that alcoholism or that addictive uh, trait is like somewhat genetic. Well, I, I think I it, I believe there's an opposite of that genetically because I'm not the only one. Like I can drink a beer and it. And enjoy it, enjoy the flavors, but if I start drinking a second one, it starts tasting bad. And it could be the exact same beer that I just drank. And I've smoked pot or hash no more than five times in my life. And I've never had a pleasant experience, ever. And I, I never got that addiction thing grab me at all. I've just never been pleased with any of it. Uh, so, you know, I would I will tolerate people around me to a certain extent to play music with them, but if it, it starts getting, you know, sketchy, you know, with other people showing up that might be bad people or, uh, you know, I just don't want to be a part of it. It's just not being dependable. And even even yeah, during that whole big house, you know, the big you know, farmhouse uh, era, I had I had a great job. I was working at, at the company he was working with. I mean, making good money doing like uh, electrical engineering type stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't. I, number one, I don't want to ruin that. And number two, I, I've got a career. I don't have time for this bullshit. We're either going to play music or we're not. I mean, that's how I felt, you know. And I tolerated some of it for a while, and then, you know, like like with Jill and in the Spades, I tolerated it for a while. But I, it just got to a point where this isn't going anywhere, and I don't want to be around these people. I mean, I I, I like them, but I can't be around these people. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it, you know. Well, it's hard when you want to play music and you have to go chasing somebody because, like, everybody went to go smoke weed and then they got lost and another yeah, and it's like well, an hour later. Well, they're still drunk and pee themselves. And to bring up yeah. and to bring up the Thrillsville thing, I played with them for for about a year. We practiced mostly. We didn't get a lot of gigs, but there again, the practices were good. But you know, when we get on stage, certain people would just get totally wasted. Because they thought that was a cool thing to do. And granted, the problem was the crowd enabled it because they would all show up to see this train wreck. And when I was on stage a couple times in the middle of that train wreck, it just, it was not something that felt good to me. It, it, this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to be part of a train wreck. I want to be part of a band that people respect. Like, wow, these guys can really play. Let's go see these guys because they're really good. Not, hey, maybe the guy will like fall off the stage again and break his arm. Uh, maybe, hey, last time I saw him, he put a hole in the bass drum, you know, with his guitar because he got mad. You know, I, I don't want to be a part of being like that. And, and I guess that, <coughs> that, that uh, I remember when he told me he was playing with Roseville. One time I came up and I saw you guys play up here. Was it, was it a... Uh, Thrillville? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, we played and, in Shepherdstown. Yeah, and and I remember going up there, and the certain person who I won't name, okay, was stinking drunk in the van, and I was like, "How do I tell my friend that that I just saw go up there and play that you need to get rid of this person because he's making you guys look bad?" Yeah. 
Yeah. And he's what the band is rotating. And, and, and he was he was the center of the band at the time. Mm -hmm. So like that. Uh, but that affected me and colors me colors my outlook when we go and play out and play with other bands other bands now and they're like getting the tray of shots and playing and drinking on stage and all this stuff and it's all a party and it's all like acting a buffoon and playing the role and stuff like that um, it makes me not want to play with them okay uh, especially when some of the clubs that we played at you know they're basically holes in the walls and stuff like that but the guys are getting like so liquored up and then when they get liquored up they get pretentious and I'm like you know trying to talk to you because for us we get up there and play and uh, one of the things that I pride myself on since I've been playing with these guys is that we already have our set list written down we know what we're going to play and to the best part they try to do bam 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 song like this none of that oh my gosh man what are we going to play what are we going to do you know or, or introducing songs for two minutes you know uh, uh stumbling around and stuff like that but then we'll go play and then the next group comes on and it's like I have to wait a half an hour for them to set up and then another 15 minutes to decide what they're going to do and stuff like that. And it's because they're stoned out of their mind or they're half drunk, you know. And um, I'm like, gosh, was I like that when I was that age? I think that's <laughs> yeah. really the most amazing part about the series that Heidi and I are doing. The showcases at, at Sky Stage, you guys have seen them. Everyone has brought their A game. Everyone has come, and it is about their music, and it is about their art. So we've got 15 minutes left on this tape. I'll throw a question on Heidi and Chris has one. The producer of this program is uh, Mr. Drew Starr, Andy Roth of uh, the Voodoo Love Gods, Cafe Della Morta, and the Driving Beats. Um, what's your relationship with Andy? Do you guys all know him? or? I know him. I um, know of him, but... Yeah. I, <laughs> I say hi to him, he recognizes me and all the stuff <laughs> like that, you know, and everything. I think he knows Adam better and he knows Sam better. He knows Sam you, really well. You guys you guys yeah. done some music together. Well we well we tried to. We met him at like what Guido's or something? Yes. We played a gig with, with them with Guido's or he ran sound or something. And uh, at the time I think he was looking for a drummer for the driving beats. So he contacted Sam to record some songs. And this was only recently, it's no, no later than like 2017 or anything. I mean, that's when I first met Andy. I, I haven't it's really, like about two years. I have not yeah. known him. The most, yeah. I, well, see, we, yeah. we've been in our own microcosm. Like, I'm the only guy that really is interfaced with, I mean, you know Tro, Troy Cool, But I mean, as far as this other, like the, the Voodoo Love Gods and all, all those people, we, we never went to school together. We never. We and, Andy's a big part of the Frederick scene through the 80s and into the <clears throat> early 90s. And then he leaves for the military. Once he goes into <clears throat> the Army, it's after the French band that he brings back. He yeah. joined, and, the, and that was Big House era. Um, he goes to France, lives in France for a while. He bring, he, he's going to bring this French band. They're going to go on tour in America. It's like whatever couch they can sleep on in whatever basement they can play in. And no showers. Uh, you know, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> but then he goes into the military and he disappears for 23 years. Comes home and to me it's like Odysseus returning, you know. And he wants to play music with his friends. In our conversation, I thought one of the heaviest things with the driving beats he had said was um, that we were talking about heavy metal, hard hard rock, and how you get old, you get tired of that at a certain age. And he goes, I don't want to listen to anything that sounds like I'm still on the battlefield. And I, I, really, I, I thought that had some resonance with you know, 
he's a fascinating guy, amazing musician. So I'm looking forward. I mean, I probably bumped into him in the earlier years. Like yeah, I probably he, bumped he into you. He Joe Grable too. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I, you know, we never played music played together because I've been with these guys for since the the late nineties, and see, in the late nineties. He was gone, right? Right. So, and there wasn't a music scene. The only music scene was at like the Raw Bar open yeah. mic night. We started that. The Vince yeah. Street Raw Bar was an incredible place, and it's a shame it's it's not there anymore. It was what every Tuesday night was open mic, something, something like, like that. that. Every Tuesday night or and, Thursday and night. I, and we I started. Like Loudmouth Thunderdogs and the Helper Mites were all that Frederick had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the time. I mean, there were some shows there, like um, you know, I at least. Set the record. I, I put on the biggest show. I, we, you were in that. That was the Thrillsville Voodoo Love God show in '99 that we put on the biggest show that they had ever had. And it was a, a, a Voodoo Love God 10 year reunion, you know. That wasn't the Halloween show, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, there I was, was there. I won, I won the Thrillsville show. I won the Halloween contest. The, 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 the Rob Pearsall match. That was the I had, I had the actual pumpkin. Pumpkin, match. I got pictures yeah. of you. Yeah, well, that's good. I got pictures of you. That's awesome. <laughs> I stay awake at I night wondering how many random through. people have pictures of me in their house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived, that, so. I lived I mean, across the street from that at 11 South Bend, so that mm -hmm. was like a regular spot. That was a crazy yeah. show. But it was a great place, um, you know, whatever night the open mic was, it was like a Tuesday or Thursday night. And I mean, to me, it was like the, the only opportunity in Frederick at the time to, play. to, 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 well, to play. Um, but also just to meet and talk with the other local musicians, regardless of you know whether it's just a an acoustic you know singer songwriter guy or a blues group or other rock bands or other I punk think bands. Didn't it, was Denny, like, it was a cool yeah. Denny Denny uh, Grizzle Denny Grizzle was right. the guy that ran it for a while. Yeah, you know Dan, that name just ding. Denny my head. Denny Grizzle. Yeah. he's got a trivia company now, Poorhouse Trivia. What, what was the name of the uh, Rick, right? Rick owned the Raw Bar, right? Yeah. And I remember he was dating, I, I lived in another group house out, out behind uh, Fredericktown Mall. He was dating one of the girls that, that lived in the house. She worked at the Raw Bar. And I remember when he came in this door, he wasn't supposed to, and I'm like, fuck bacon, I go char. I didn't know who the fuck out of my room. <laughs> <laughs> Good, old day. Good story, Don. Yeah, bro. <laughs> uh, you know, Wrong <laughs> but if, I mean, Frederick doesn't have a, a raw bar anymore. Um, it doesn't have a. Yeah, that, there's that, no open mic. Uh, what, I, there, there are a couple what, open what mics, but they tend to be more well, you know, acoustic guitar you know, type. You know, another place that started doing it after the raw bar, maybe simultaneously, was you know where Betty's used to be, where where Oscars is now. They used to oh, do. Oh, that's right. That was it. Was see, it was Jekyll and Hyde for a while, and it was something. But like I think that. it was called Betty's back then. Where is the what? Where is that? So where it's, no, where, it's um the um, East Street Shopping Center. Krugs. Yeah, Krugs was the. Krugs was there. Krugs. Yeah, but it was Betty's. It was a diner. Okay. Right, and after that it was Krugs. I think Krugs is what really started the music scene there. Well, they did the metal. They were really yeah, into the metal. Remember, we play Krugs. We played Krugs with Doctor Sardonica. From the Misfits. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun night. Oh, oh, you talking about the Misfits? Yeah, why don't you tell them the story? <laughs> this is our closest. Our closest. Well, I, I have one to follow up on that. It was close. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Closest brush to freedom uh, uh, to to fame, to, to fame stardom. Uh, there was a club up in Pennsylvania called the Chameleon, Chameleon club. club. Okay. And it's pretty well known. Mm -hmm. Apparently, we do this. We our first CD, right? Yeah, we made a press pack. We made a press pack. And we right. don't we never had a, a manager or an agent. We always just do it ourselves. Okay. okay. Or Matt Burns. Matt Burns uh, kind of discovered us in Martinsburg at Cookies. Yeah. But that's on the map. But anyhow, before Matt Burns, I would create these press packs and, and mail it to people. So I mailed one to the Chameleon Club and our CD is really well produced. Zach, Zach did it. it. Need bang up job. Yeah, oh. it, it sounds really good. And so they get the CD and the press pack, you know, with some pictures and crap like that. And uh, apparently, 
they thought we were like a real band. A nash yeah, <laughs> a nationally known real band because it sounds really good. And um, so they had us up there and they told us, we're going to put you on a bill with the Misfits. You're going to open for the Misfits. Oh, so and, psyched. And, and uh, Marky Ramone's band was going to be there too. So we're excited. We're like, this is pretty tits, right? We can go up to <laughs> Lancaster and like open for the Misfits. This is pretty cool. This is, this is cred. This is street cred now, right? <laughs> so we get up there and... Uh, the, the woman that booked us is like, oh, great, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm so glad that you guys would, were willing to do it and telling me how much we would get. It was like 300 and some bucks. It was like the most we would ever get. Yeah, that's a lot. So she's like, yeah, so take your stuff down, you know, downstairs into the bar area and blah, blah, blah. So we take our stuff down there, and it's, it's like a dingy bar. I don't think the room was much bigger than, like, this combined space. And uh, there's a little teeny corner to set up in. I think you put your amp on top of my amp because there was from the yeah, so side by side. Of, and, and she sold this this bill as hey, we got the mics, we got the PA. You don't have to just bring your your instruments and your amps and drums. And they stuck us in this little. And and the guy we we put our stuff in, and the bartender's like. Uh, when, when you guys are you gonna start soon and we're like well yeah but where's the mics where's the PA where's oh you didn't bring any and so he had this PA and I think he only had one speaker that worked and one microphone and we weren't opening for the misfits the misfits were playing upstairs, upstairs in the concert the hall they stage. had a concert hall up there and we were gonna be playing at the same time as they were so nobody's going to come see us. They're all going right. to be watching the Misfit. It's it's like if we were playing before them, they would maybe get a chance to be like, seen. Hey, yes, no, man. no, no. Everybody was upstairs, it's and there was like, some other band opening for us. She switched yeah, it at the last yeah, minute. She switched. She switched the, the 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 ticket. Okay, and the other band, they were playing. I don't know, but it didn't go at all. It didn't match up with the with, with the music. Yeah, it didn't. It was awful. It was awful. We would have served uh, better because our stuff was more like what the Misfits were doing. Right. And I was always I was so pissed. And I was I was like, you know, if there ever was a time where Mike would have just, you know, flipped out on somebody. Oh, said the hell with the show must go on. Fuck this shit. I'm leaving. Okay. Because they told us that we were going to open for them. And she was. We told all our friends we we're going to open for the Misfits and all that stuff. Yeah, you know. So we played one or two sets. I don't know what we did. But one or two sets, and then she had the nerve to be mad that there was nobody down there. I said, "Well, everyone's upstairs." Upstairs. Yeah, it's like. And it was a packed house. There were like about five, six hundred people up there. Oh, wow. Yeah, at least. But she paid us, and we went on our way, and just vowed not to like try to play there. Play anymore. Lancaster again. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your what's yeah, what's your plan? Oh, well, we keep on bringing up cookies. Um, so cookies oh, yeah. was this little hole in the wall. Um, just south Is that of here, Mom? Yeah. 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 Oh, it's great place. I don't think it's there. called cookies anymore. Yeah. But um, well, we played there a handful of times. I think Matt set up most of those shows for yeah, us. Matt, yeah, Matt saw us there on the show you're going to talk about. Yeah, so... Um, That's how we got in with it. Yeah, see, we don't play very many important shows, so Adam already knows which one I'm going to talk about. But we we um, were actually able to play a show with Joe Jack Talcum from the Dead Milkmen at this, you know. Now that one we actually did open for Joe Jack. Yeah, um, and that that was a really cool, uh, really cool he experience. Went, he was with a band called Uke Box, and it was a punk band that just played ukuleles, mm -hmm. and it was actually really good. Yeah. It was really good, yeah. but. The, the one I thought you were going to say was the first cookies gig that he played with us. Um, we walked in, same situation, a beat up PA where only one or two channels work, one PA speaker, no monitors, no mic stands, and one microphone. And we had to take, they had, to, they had uh, billiard tables there, so we took a cue stick stand, two cue sticks, we one of us held the microphone and we duct tape the microphone between the two cue sticks and used that to sing in and we just keep 
like taking turns. It's probably the most punk rock thing we've ever. And it, and it was it, it, it was just a rock and show. There was a ton of people yeah. there dancing right up into you, and like it, it was it was pretty. And, and Matt Burns was there. He's like, hey, these guys are good. I'm gonna start. And, and we never had to pay him a dime. He would get us shows, and we would play with Payne a lot. Timmy uh, Rodiger's band, and. I, I can't say enough nice things about Timmy. I mean, he's he's, he's, he's a total a professional. He's too. a gentleman. Total professional too. It, it, and I always liked. But whenever we had a show with Pain, I knew it's going to be a good show. These guys are going to be on time. There's not going to be any fucking around. I mean, they were like us. You know, not not quite straight edge, but no alcohol going on and no smoking dope. No, you know, all business. He wants to do his metal show. It was all perfectly executed. So, yeah, I can't. I, I'm I'm kind of thrilled that he's going to be part of the Rock School event. Hopefully, you know, in September. I get to see him. Yeah, again. I have my fingers crossed that they're able to get that thing together in, in, you know, in a short amount of time. Well, yeah, they got. I mean, you can clearly see they got a lot. A lot of work to do. There. Yep. So I know you guys like to have. It's fun, you know, and you show up and you do. What's your vision for Helgermites here in the future? Uh, to me, I, I guess we'll keep playing until we, get, you know, one of us uh, retires and moves away. Get the author. Or we can't. I mean, I, I seriously, seriously think that because um, he, he jokes about uh, arthritis, but we, we all do okay with what we got. And but seriously, uh, the what is it? Last summer, it was ridiculous. It was like old man Father Time hit all of us oh. right in a row. Okay, Sam had to get his back operated on. Then after you know, wait a couple of months for the drummer to get back together. Then as soon as he got back together, I had to get a. Uh, what is it? Spinal fusion and um, and uh, decompression. Hip. Hips. You know. Yeah. The but only one by the grace of God that has been untouched by the scalpel's knife is this guy here. Well, he's not old enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But I think we'll just keep. I mean, we have enough material now for almost two more albums, really. Yes. That we need to record. So we'll, we'll get those recorded. I still want to get this third album out. I, I need artwork. I might have to punt and do like a photograph collage thing, maybe. Um, but we'll just keep recording and making albums and playing out. I mean, we kind of we kind of put the limit on maybe playing once a month because we yeah. all have serious jobs, jobs. And, yeah. and we can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I work shift, and it's it's a pain in the ass sometimes. To to do a gig like this right here I I'm on mid shift right now I called out yesterday so I could get enough sleep so that I could be here by one o'clock two o'clock today so that's it on my tape gentlemen Chris if there's anything you want to close your show with uh, just I know Don's heard me say this question a couple of times, but I'm gonna start breaking down. Um, so y'all, he'll keep recording. What uh, in for you guys doing this for the past what twenty some odd years or so? Um, what changes have y'all noticed in the in, in the industry in regards to you know how punk has changed over the years and so forth? Well, I noticed like um, there's this horror metal thing or horror punk thing that's come into being and it, which is cool it's not my bag but it seems like there's you know um, you'll get bands like like pain uh, scare Go scarecrow's curse trigger 13 trigger th there's a horror punk band. okay trigger 13 I'm not really familiar with them uh, Another band, the Renfields. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they they come out. One guy's we dressed like a them. werewolf. Yeah. yeah. One guy makes them look like uh, the Great Pumpkin, and uh, 
So there's like a lot of makeup involved and like more of a stage production type of visual thing going on, costuming and and um, like that aspect of war. Yeah, yeah, sort of like a mini war thing. There might not be a huge stage show involved, but everybody no pyrotechnics or anything like right. that. Everybody's in costume, costume and they'll they'll role play kind of, and it's fun. Um, the guy that does the Renfields also has a band called the Jasons. I don't know if you ever... They all come out wearing Jasons. Nah, they all look like Jason. And they play. And they play, like, just punk stuff. Like, melodical stuff. It's not, like, doom metal stuff. It's just... But it's cool. It's like, uh, you know, you want to see the Jasons, man. It's cool. They like, dress like Jason. With the hockey mask and stuff. But, um... That we notice. So, uh, we're back. <laughs> um, uh, one final question is the fact that uh, with a lot of the younger generation, those younger than, than us, um, what advice do you have for them up and coming? Oh, well, like, just do what you love. Um, you know, um, I have no right to play guitar, but I do it anyway. And I play it my way and no one else's. And I, you know, not that I'm a great artist, but I think there are many great artists out there in the world that have become great artists because they do it their way. So this, you know. I know it, it. this is going to be a similar question to the one I just asked, but um, it's one I haven't really asked. There, it seems to be coming up more, seeing more um, I don't want to say girls, but women being in the heavy metal and the punk and that sort of thing. What, what advice, if there are a lot of young women out there who want to be in a similar situation to you guys, uh, being heavy metal or punk, what advice do you have to give to them? Don't take no for an answer, okay? Uh, I've played in bands with ladies before. Uh, best drum ever played with was was a woman. Okay, she had did her double bass that was phenomenal. Okay, uh, the, the the thing the thing that I see with you know it's and 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 I can see that with somebody being young and uh, let's say being high school age or something like that, and then they want to get something in, started in somebody's garage or basement or stuff like that and guys being the way guys are when they're that age um, getting the door slammed in your face or whatever it is or you know girls aren't supposed to you know yeah g girls will probably get I don't I don't know if they'll get as much as they used to but they used to get a lot of hate yes like in the 90s undeserved if they, hate. If they would if they had a band the boys wouldn't like it because it's like it's a, you know intruding on their territory, you know. but um, you know, it, and this goes with with the guys too. Is don't lose focus of what you're doing, and and you know, keep your eye on the ball. Don't get distracted by you know. This might sound kind of selfish. But don't get don't get uh, distracted by broken people that don't want to help themselves. People that that are into drugs or just just broken people. It's not your job to fix them, and if you want, if you want that, that thing, you know, playing at certain clubs or you know, becoming famous enough to be discovered, which is really going to be rare, you got to keep focused, and you got to just play your music. You get, you get distracted by these people, and they're going to be all over the place. They're going to be in every freaking nook and cranny, and they're going to suck your energy out. And they're all energy vampires. And, and, and you got to just stay, cut them out of your life, if they're in your life, and stay away from them from that point. It's tough. It's hard. It's what you got to do. I'm, I'm personally, I'm not familiar with a lot of the female um, performers that are currently in the industry in regards to heavy metal and so forth and so on. But I want to recommend, because again, we're about the same age group. You have Joan Jett, you know, one of the most popular, just being that rocker, just rocking out, wearing the leather, wearing, you know, just doing her thing and pretty much saying, I don't want to hear nothing, you guys. I want to be that rocker. So, 
yeah, it's you know they need to just stay focused and like don't don't let don't let the guys take advantage. I'm I'm a guy, you yeah. know, and really I, I'm not I'm not I'm not a feminist, but you, yeah. I know what I see when I see it, and it's like don't get don't get caught caught up in it, and don't let your head don't let it get to your head, like try to just remain congenial. And you know, I, that's what I would recommend. I mean, I, you know, I think they get a little pretentious. Sometimes they get a little pretentious. One thing I would I would definitely suggest if this was my sister I was talking to, okay, is is that number one, if you have a, a dream, a, a goal that you want to accomplish, you yourself have to decide how far you're going to take it in as far as chasing that dream. Okay, and sometimes in order to get obtain that dream, sometimes you have to let relationships take a back seat. Yeah. Okay, and some for some people that's very hard to do. Don't have a boyfriend. Don't have well, a girlfriend. Because well, I've seen women, other women musicians that I played with. They get in a relationship and you know their career is going along fine, but they get in a relationship and next thing you know they stop what they're doing or whatever gets sidetracked or because uh, he doesn't like it or she doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't like. He doesn't like her going out and playing clubs every night and you know or they can't understand or don't have the mindset. The guy's too insecure that the woman, if she's in a band and playing in a band, when you get off the stage, there's a certain amount of PR that you got to do. Yeah, you got to face audience. the crowd. You got to talk to you got to talk to people. You got to be nice. You got to you know be witty, joke and stuff like that. And they're just like you know, what are you doing talking with that guy? You know and stuff. She's not trying to pick him up. She's, she's trying, trying to develop to her fan base. Yeah, she's, 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 she's selling her song. You know, she's selling her song. She's selling, selling the band, selling the merch. Like yeah, you yeah. guys would probably would too. Trying to sell the merch. Yeah, but no, the nobody comes up to us. Uh, but. <laughs> Give Nobody talks to me after we play. It's funny, no, especially as bandmates. They, they, they come yeah. up to me and yeah. say, "Why are you still here?" But uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for staying. But but that's the, that, that's the thing, you know. Sometimes you got and 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 it, and it doesn't matter whether you're a musician or whatever in any career, you know. Sometimes you, uh, uh, my sister's an architect, okay, and sometimes there's a lot of burning the midnight oil. Uh, Staying late, working, um, not being able to go out with their friends, you know, whatever, because you're, you're trying to do your thing and, and you got to get ahead. And uh, there's a very small portion of us that are fortunate enough to have to be discovered or to have things just drop in your lap where you didn't have to go and bang on doors and. Uh, what live off of spaghetti and, and, and <laughs> bologna, <laughs> sandwiches. bologna sandwiches and stuff like that, and just play these dive bars, you know, for years until you finally get your chops together so yeah. that you are good enough. And, and I'm just sad, you know, just have fun. Have fun. And for we're, us, we're, we're sitting here talking about, you know, you got to work hard and, and uh, <laughs> you know, do all these things um, if, if you're serious about making it. You know, um, one thing I learned a long time is never make your something you love your job because you don't love it anymore. And I think if someone loves playing music, that's going to come out in, in what they write and how they play. And I think that love of it's going to help them be successful. Okay, that that's pretty much all, all I got. Don, do you have any follow-ups for I the follow-ups? We're good. Uh, Heidi. Okay, that's that's it. Thank you, Thank guys. Thank you, Albert Wrights. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed that interview with the folks from the Helgramites. Uh, and I want to thank them for allowing us to record the the audio from the interview. Don as well. Uh, thank you so much for including us and the show in on this project. Uh, if Folks at home, if you have any questions that you would like uh, me to pass on to Don that you think that he's not asking these these bands, uh, please do so by sending us an email at longcoatmafia at gmail.com 
or you can leave the question in the comments of the pinned post for this episode on our Facebook page. Or you could DM us the comments and the questions on Twitter. Our Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash the Long Coat Mafia podcast. While you're there, please, as much as uh, Facebook doesn't like us to say it, hit that uh, like button up top and follow us there. Um, don't forget to uh, leave a reaction. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, or anything else, uh, please do so in anything that we post. If it's show uh, current episode related, please do it in the pinned post for that episode particular episode uh you can also send us a dm on twitter our twitter handle is long coat mafia our um uh instagram handle is also long coat mafia and you could also send us uh email by sending it to long coat mafia at gmail.com uh we do read emails on a on air uh if it's directed at a specific person or like don in this case if you feel like he should be asking a, a certain type of question. We'll be more than happy to pass it on to Don. Or ask it ourselves if we are uh, at another one of these uh, these interviews that Don is doing. So, uh, that being said, for those of you that are listening to this uh, VIA, somebody else playing it. We are on... Uh, your desktop, if you have an internet connection, you're able to find us on, uh, at least for the moment, uh, iTunes or whatever Apple is using right now uh, to get the uh, the podcast. It could be their own desktop version of Apple Podcasts. Um, we are also available on Spotify, uh, Stitcher Radio, uh, and and our main website, which is the Mafia dot Podbean. Dot com and you're able to download download uh, all any of our episodes going back to the beginning that means you could hear the the driving beats episode that Don uh, mentioned uh, I should say uh, the folks from the Helgamites mentioned or I think it was Don mentioned in this episode you could down go back and download that episode and hear that interview uh, or the interview with trigger 13. Uh, which was last week's episode, if you missed that. So uh, check all out all these episodes that we're doing in regards to the Fred, documenting the Frederick Underground with Don Ramirez. So um, where else? Uh, it, we're also on YouTube. That's right. You can listen to these episodes on YouTube. Um, even though the, there's no video attached to them, it'll be a static image, and you, but you're able to listen to us. Uh, just search for Long Coat Mafia on YouTube. No, actually, the Long Coat Mafia podcast on YouTube, to be more specific. That way, we're closer to the top, and you don't get those stupid crazies um, and their videos. But a lot of our videos should be close to the top as well. So while you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Uh, we have loads of, uh, of videos there. Uh, we got two videos that we have to post up from this past weekend, one of which is containing a clip, uh, a visual clip of this uh, interview in regards to the Helgamites. And another one is that we were at the local beer festival again this year. We didn't partake, but we were there documenting everything. So please stay tuned to our YouTube channel. While you're there, hit that subscribe button. And if you like any of the videos that we show you, hit that like button into there as well. And hit make a comment down below if need be especially if you're listening to this episode on youtube so um don't forget that we do if i haven't mentioned it already we do have an instagram account that way you can see where we are what we're doing what we're documenting and our um instagram handle is long coat mafia so go there and check us out so follow us there and as i stated uh our twitter handle is Long Coat Mafia as well. You can always leave us DMs if you are primarily a Instagram or a um, Twitter user. And we'll read those uh, direct messages on the air. Please uh, give us a message, at least a detailed message of what you're trying to do that way. We don't think you're one of those stupid spammers that keep messaging us on either Instagram or on Twitter. So, uh, what else? We do have a Mixer.com uh channel a mixer channel um yeah that's right just like for those of you that follow ninja uh 
We do have a Mixer.com uh, channel as well. It is LCMP. Those letters are in capital are capitalized. And yes, we should be streaming more often. We got to do that. And hopefully by the time that Borderlands 3 comes out, we will be streaming that once we get it. Hopefully on Mixer. And we'll probably be co-streaming because we know how to do it. Uh, even though our Xbox One doesn't allow us, we will probably be co-streaming it on Twitch as well. Our Twitch handle channel is... Uh, where to find us is twitch.tv forward slash the Long Coat Mafia pod. Uh, we'll hopefully we'll put links on and Twitter where to find us and where we are uh, streaming at the moment. So follow us on Twitter there and um, maybe follow us on Instagram as well because we'll try to uh, handle both birds, so to speak. Um, that's about it. Uh, again, if you enjoy it, special thanks to Don and the Helgamites for letting us record. And special thanks to the Let There Be Rock School for letting us do our thing at their school. They're a wonderful organization, charitable organization. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about them, please email us again at longcoatmafia at gmail.com. We'll be happy to send the information about them and their charitable organization and what they do to you and where to find them on the internet so that being said i've been rambling too long take care have a good week see you next week in regards to more geeky stuff and who knows what will be said so take care i'm off to watch SummerSlam. you've been listening to the long coat mafia podcast the internet's most hated and mafia themed geek podcast 